Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I am your host, Chris Spangle. We Are Libertarians brings you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves. Think of us as the love child of National Review and Mad Magazine. We explain to you what the hell is happening in our world today and how we can fix it by thinking differently. Please be sure to rate and review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, share this episode with friends, and support us through PayPal or Patreon at wearelibertarians.com. We are supported by listeners like you, so $1 per episode by pledging $5 a month helps us grow. We are always taking your questions and comments via email at editor at weirdlibertarians.com. And we have a Dear Leader letter that is critical of Dear Leader today. Uh, Nathan, <coughs> Nathan's going to get it. No, he hates me. <laughs> if you are new to the program, we catch up for the first 20 minutes or so, and then a deep dive into analyzing current events and society from a libertarian perspective. This show is for adults by semi-adults, so please be warned, the language is strong and offensive. Joining me, as always, is the reliable co-host, Greg Lenz. Greg, how are you? I'm doing well, Chris. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, Kat is off this week. She is. It is recruitment week, and uh, I was sent a Snapchat of 72 female college students in a dorm room chanting. Oh, God. It was, it'd, it'd be we torture. We are AOPI! Oh, yeah. <laughs> blood it, and soil, I thought. No, <laughs> no, no, sorry. It was not blood and soil. It was uh, something completely... The challenger was fine. She made it back to Ball State. Plenty of time to start school. <laughs> <laughs> the, not a scratch on that challenger. Yeah, Cat, uh, of course, not on the Instagram, because as we mentioned on a previous episode, not aesthetic. <laughs> yeah. Could you imagine? I couldn't. I could never be in a sorority. You know, in Germany, no, that I could would be land in you in jail. I could be in a sorority, not a fraternity. Could you? <laughs> well, I'm good with women. That's true. <laughs> oh, right. I saw where I was going. Uh, <laughs> now, Matt. Uh, Matt Whitliff also joins us. Matt, how are you? Doing? Hello. I'm doing well. Thank you. Uh, that mic is a little hot because you talk Ooh. louder than Cat does. You have a oh, boy. her voice is deeper than yours. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll. Uh... Yeah, uh, and then that laugh you hear. Join AO Pie. <laughs> <laughs> so Cat will. Cat is not leaving us. Cat is just busy with school, and she's going to do her best to come on as often as she can. So, please send her encouraging notes as she begins her school year. We all know how difficult school is for Cat. <laughs> Communications isn't as easy as it used to be. It I mean, takes her a long time to learn. You don't just fail TV, <laughs> you know, without trying. <laughs> uh, in the if you're watching the video on YouTube, we have a very very attractive blonde in the corner, but she's not going to talk to us because she doesn't want to be on the podcast. But she's reading. Uh, that is, uh, I don't. I won't say your name because it seems like you don't want your name said. But uh, just our luck that um, we get we get <laughs> a woman on the podcast. And she won't talk to us. What's your, what's your Do you want to say your name? Yeah, sure. Hi. Uh, oh, i got to turn your mic on. What's your name? <laughs> I'm Morgan. Morgan oh. Bean. Hi, yeah. Morgan. Hi, Morgan. Hi, Morgan. Hi, Morgan. We're Tell all, us your story. We're all never bitten her, too. <laughs> now, Morgan is the girlfriend of Brett Bittner. I wouldn't say girlfriend. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> abductee. <laughs> now, how long have you been held hostage? <laughs> um, uh, three months. Three months. Very nice. Right. Since the wall li last wall live. Yeah, right. You guys you brought, brought us her. together. Right. Actually. And They're you said, I want you to meet this liberalitarian. And I just looked at her and was like, you're getting helicoptered. <laughs> <laughs> no liberalitarians. That's Greg's policy. Yes. Now, All commies are the same. Uh, I have, I don't know what I was thinking, but I have broken my own rule and invited Bittner back on. Uh, Bittner, Brett Bittner, welcome back. Hi, Spangle. How are you? I've been doing pretty well. You look fantastic. You do. Thank you. Uh, the, the number one reason is not the 20-year-old uh, blonde that is sitting over in the corner. It's Bittner, and to look and see how good he looks. You, uh, you look fantastic. Thank you. You've uh, you got to talk into that mic though. I'm trying. I, right. I also want to make sure that I keep eye contact because I don't trust you over there. You're a gypsy. You're a thieving <laughs> gypsy. <laughs> you will never get this. <laughs> I went to America with a job of gypsy tears to protect me from AIDS. <laughs> if if you haven't seen Borat recently, you've got to. Oh, it's so it's, good. It's glorious. It's so good. So good. Uh, Bittner, you have conquered diabetes, and it's uh, it is August as we record this, August seventeenth, seven thirty-eight p.m. 
And uh, in October, you were diagnosed with diabetes, and yep. then you did what? Uh, I changed the way that I eat. Mm-hmm. That was it. That's it? Um, I mean, I took the medicine that the doctor told me to. Uh, I changed the way that I eat to adopt uh, a ketogenic diet. Go ahead. I'm ready. Hit me. Greg. No, no, that's I think good. it's that's awesome. Good. Yeah, it's it's great. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, you keto costed diabetes. Yes, exactly. I, I will say my number one uh, motivator for working out since January and losing weight and getting myself healthy is to avoid diabetes. Yeah, well, I don't blame you. <laughs> N- not because I don't want I don't want diabetes. <laughs> That'd be bad. What would be far worse is keto Bittner coming into my life and trying to train me to beat. <laughs> Diabetes, so Bittner imperialism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Brett, you look fantastic. We're very proud of the weight that you have lost. We are very proud of it the, is cha- awesome. the changes that you've made in your life. Very, very Except- good to see you feel happy and and uh, look as effervescent as as you ever have. <laughs> Seems like you'll be Thank happier. You. Once he he you also get- stopped hanging out with me, so that might have a little bit to a little do bit. with uh, his happiness. That's, I don't know. I don't he's know. less swarthy. I don't know if keto <laughs> makes you change. But uh, I feel like we're not quite as ethnically close as we used to be. Aww. And then, uh, Sorry to listen, hear that, Greg, you're going to be so much happier once you stop hanging out with an INTJ. Uh, honestly, like <laughs> she's she's uh, she's an INTJ. They're my mortal enemy. I'm not sure why INTJs are pretty cool. They make up two percent of the population. Actually, fun fact. Because that's. <laughs> That's why. That was the most INTJ shit I've ever heard. <laughs> if you have to know what percentage of the population your Myers-Briggs is, I feel like it's not that popular. <laughs> it's it's kind of like libertarianism. In fact, INTJs are a majority of libertarians. Are they predominantly libertarian? Yeah. That actually makes quite a bit of sense, really. <laughs> the Very NT analytical and logical. The yeah. NT specifically, but INTJs do make up a really large I would think the percentage. I as well. Yes. Predominantly. Mm-hmm. Well, Lots I, of basement dwelling. Welcome to the party. I don't like it. <laughs> Thank you. You will love all the other women you'll meet. I'm <laughs> all four of them. Yeah. I'm an ENFJ, and uh, therefore I like people. I uh, just need a lot of time away from them. <laughs> uh, all right. So we love hate relationship with we, other people. We need to start out this episode uh, by confirming that none of us are racist. Uh, Greg, what's your feeling on the Jews? Jesus was a great man. You uh, know, I've often believed that. Um, you know, like Thomas Jefferson, who wrote a, a Bible, his own Bible of Jesus, that uh, it is the best moral philosophy one can live. I, I'm a big, I love the Jews. Mm-hmm. Uh, Matt. Big uh, Jew fan. J- Jews? <laughs> Bittner? Um, yeah, I, I, we're cool. I have right. many friends who are Jews. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Morgan, do you want to weigh in on the Jews? Uh, I'm pro-Jew. All right, okay, we're going to go down the, uh, we need to, apparently, in this day and age... You need to make public declaration. You right. need to juice signal. Is really yes. what you need to do. Now, uh, I love black. Would people. that be virtue signaling? Virtue signaling. <laughs> yes. Very good. Now, if you were to choose one race, what would it be? Mine would be black. I would be a black man, uh, because this is why all these people in Charlottesville are upset because black men are so cool that they're stealing all of our women. Yeah, I mean and, that's uh, how Hillary Clinton lost in two thousand eight. She lost to the cool black guy. That's what right. she said. Exactly. Uh, the 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 the. Dorkiest black man, like Harry is the coolest out of all of us because oh, hands black. down, yeah. I mean, nobody has more street cred on wall with the uh, LARPers up in New Hampshire. That um, <laughs> one of their guys just had a documentary on Vice, very, very good, very good. <laughs> <laughs> so, big, big fan of the black people, Matt. Um, Malaysians, you, you that's mean your Malaysian? first yeah. choice, yeah. really. All right, I like that. that's the one I've never heard. Is there any reason why? Um, no. I wonder, I've never had Malaysian cuisine. I have. I've been to Malaysia. Oh, you have? Yeah, yeah. And it's great? I mean, it's okay. I'm kind of, I was much more of a picky eater then, so, but, you know, I I managed. I had rice. Okay. Chicken. Imagine that. There you go. Rice. (laughs) Now, Bittner, what race would you be? Uh, I would be South Asian, actually. All right. I can't decide between... Indian and Pakistani, so I'm just going with South Asian as a you, subcontinent. So from You're the Kashmir. subcontinent, basically. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, Morgan, what race would you be? Um, I think I would be Japanese. All right. Mm. Okay. Good skincare products. <laughs> okay. Um. <laughs> Greg. <laughs> Greg? <laughs> I can't even. I literally can't even. <laughs> I raff. I kid. <laughs> No. Um, I would probably choose, hmm, Italian. Mm. <clears throat> That's uh, not really a race. Roman, honestly. Then. No. Well, neither was Malaysian or Japanese. They yeah, were just they countries. Are. That's different I'm than just, white. You know. like, Italian. Oh, you mean like 
Well, I mean, I'm I'm Native American. I'm kind of like a unicorn. Oh, so. whatever. You're like one sixteenth. You're no more Native American than I am. I'm calling bullshit. <laughs> you, you, black, Asian, or <laughs> Aboriginal North American <laughs> fascism will not be tolerated. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, uh, I I don't know. I guess Pacific I Pacific Islander. Yeah, I think, Pacific Islander. Probably. That's what I usually check on my step. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm pro, I'm pro typhoon. So, <laughs> so that's what that would be my that would be my choice. So, are you just trying to get closer to my sister? Oh, does she live out there? No, she's Pacific Islander. Is she really? Yeah, and she doesn't look I at all. I thought something was different. I thought she looked more like Spanish or something like no, that. No, we have different dads. Oh, okay. So, is that how I would get closer to your sister? <laughs> to assume <laughs> to, her to become yeah to become Pacific Islander yeah that's how you would do we'll, it. We'll no, be- to date her. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> honestly. It's tr- trading Bittners is a great TV show. That's one of my favorites. Flip this Bittner. Flip this Bittner. <laughs> now uh, let's let's just pause right here because something is so weird with the audio chain. All right, that seems better. All right, now uh, let, let's we're goofing off. And that is the subject Can of... Can I change my answer? Sure. What would you be? I want to be Canadian. Oh, no, oh, shut, up, shut up. I'm just trying to suck up to Dear Leader. <laughs> no, you, you, you wore out your welcome already. We're only hey, six minutes into this. I I'm... brought you n- the nectar of your people. Not only is he advancing a five-year-old joke, six-year-old joke. I know, it's He terrific. brought me alcohol. That's true. Greg. From the homeland. Yeah, from right. the homeland. Right. Though. And... Made with real and, red maple leaves. And... <laughs> He turned down the Tim Hortons. Uh, well, well, I didn't. I wasn't offered a donut. I would have uh, eaten a donut. The, the Tim Hortons that we that we brought back from Lansing for you. I, d- I didn't see it <laughs> from Lansing. He ate that in the car. Oh. Right. <laughs> Never mind. Right. She's gonna like shit it out, and then well, here's the Tim Hortons. He's keto, so technically, who ate the Hortons? Oh, Horton ate a who? I totally did because I'd never had Tim Hortons before, so I okay. tried it. Was it good? <laughs> oh, it was delicious. I mean, sugar is still the devil, but it was delicious. Okay, and you were fine yeah. after. Yeah. Now uh, you've brought me a a, a gift. Yes, of ginger after, beer. After the wall party last weekend, I always enjoy <laughs> breakfast the next morning with Lion Jeremiah Morrill and his um, lovely girlfriend Sarah Potter. And right. so we always go to Stacks, a local establishment where everyone comes and fawns over Jeremiah and his power and literally and kingdom. It's we. So we go to rural, they take me to Rural King. I've never been. He does. I've he, never been. He does. You. He takes me into Rural King. As we're walking in. There's the mayor in line, at, not joking, the mayor of Newcastle, in line and shouts in silent. And so I think it's odd. Usually she would, you know, chime in, hey, hey how are you? Turns out Uh-oh. she was in a cook off, food cook off, by one of the judges and 83 by another. She lost She was fing Wow. And I mean, about it, just be lined, and then I get up. Like, not a fan. <laughs> didn't like my chili. Wow. wow. <laughs> it's because she didn't just pass off Skyline as her own. I know she trumped him. We did Skyline. We didn't really. She works have... Gold Star. That's why she wears Honestly. that on her shirt. <laughs> no. She's a chili. You're a chili dog aficionado, are you not? I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't say that. No. You big chili dog fan, right, Bittner? I'm I'm from Cincinnati, so I'm uh, I'm a Skyline fan. Oh, okay. For the record, okay. not Gold Star, Skyline. All right, okay. you're loud. I I believe you. I just like to tease you about your love of the white trash chili fast food establishments. Yeah, <laughs> I mean honestly, I'm, I'm sorry. Too- you hate white trash. What should I say? Oh, I hate that Caucasian term. poverty, Appalachian <laughs> no, chili. I there you go. Hate I hate that term. Oh, what can I? Huh. What should I say? Just smelly people. <laughs> there you go. People with no teeth. Walmart no. late night shoppers. There you go. With that their works. weird walks. Residents or, of Indiana. Their weird oh, walks. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. you never gone to Walmart at like 3 a.m. Oh, on I a night have. of insomnia and seen the weird walks that go on down the aisles? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like Jurassic Park. I, I always thought those were awesome, yeah. but they're pretty expensive. Yes. Yeah. No, this is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start a how to podcast thing. Okay. And with, to do that, you can't do it with. Like, you need a mic that looks, like... Professional. Yeah. So, all right. Let's get to Dear Leader. <laughs> let's deal with Nathan. Olmstead? No, 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 no. Different oh, no, okay, cool, good. No, no, this is not him. This is a different Nathan. This is a nice Nathan. You'll you'll like him, I think. 
Now, Nathan writes, uh, Dear Leader, uh, which you can write, Dear Leader, at editor at wearelibertarians.com. He writes, Dear Leader, I've been listening to We Are Libertarians, uh, the podcast, since back in 2011 before the 2012 presidential election. Fake news because we started March 8th, 2012, but we'll, de we'll accept it. Thank you for listening for so long. I was just discovering that I was really a libertarian-leaning dude and was looking for educational resources, including podcasts, that could help me get a libertarian perspective on stuff. I'll cut to the chase so I don't waste your time. And as we all know, Dear Leader's time is very important, so do not waste it, listener. I just wanted to make a simple suggestion. There's another ten paragraphs here. <laughs> While I do find some of the banter in the beginning of the show pretty funny, and of course we listeners develop a vested interest in the lives of the personality we listen to on the show, I think you often let the banter run a on a bit too long, and I find myself drifting and becoming disinterested. How dare you? The show is sometimes it's over why I don't listen. two and a half <laughs> hours, which is pretty long, and part of that is because there is a lot of tangential... Tangen Tangential. Thank you. Tan <laughs> <laughs> Boy, if we did drops, I would pull that in a heartbeat. <laughs> Bullshitting mixed in. Some of it adds value to the show because it adds some comic relief to some pretty serious topics, but sometimes it turns into what sounds like bros in a bar talking shit. I suffer through these. Quit shaking your head, Bittner. That's why, why I don't listen. Why did I invite him? <laughs> Honestly, uh, I thought it was a setup know. so I could hit him with my challenger. <laughs> <laughs> I, beep beep. <laughs> <laughs> having his tar -code as, tar car towed as we speak. Uh, his brand new car that he bought right after he destroyed Jeremiah's. Yeah. It, to be fair, he gave us such pleasure by wrecking Jeremiah Morrill's truck that I'm almost glad. I feel bad for Jeremiah and feel bad that you had to spend the money, but that has been so much fun. You, and we turned you into a verb. Bittnerd. You yep. got bittnerd. You got bittnerd. Happens. Bittnerd. Yep. Never bittner. Yeah. Yep. I suffer through those moments because I really enjoy discussions about the hot issues and love that you provide a logical and reasonable perspective that I can only get via few outlets. I think if you steered the conversation back on track a bit more quickly, rather than letting it trail off for several minutes at a time, certainly add value and possibly become more attractive to other prospective listeners. I hope you take this as constructive criticism rather than some random dick trying to tear you down. I only want the show, the grow, the show to grow be, and becomes even more popular. Keep up the good work, Nate. Now, Nate, thank you for such a nice and thoughtful letter. You clearly took a lot of time to write this, and I really do appreciate that. But where do you get off? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, this is something Greg and I probably have a conversation about how much, and we call it the, the, the goofing off and the autism. And we are constantly having discussions about how to balance the two because, you know, we as we do something different than any other podcast. You can go and listen to The Red Meat and get it in 20, Woods, uh, 20 minutes from Tom Woods every day, Every other political podcast out there does a lot of that in-depth conversation, and we do have a much more unique perspective than I think a lot of other people. But what we are different in that we also give you a look into our lives. We're a little more personal, and it is designed to be uh, sound like bros talking in a bar talking shit. And so the course of the conversation kind of winds in the way that your normal conversation between friends would wind. Uh, but I do take your criticism seriously, and I have tried to rein it in. I think if you listened to last week's episode, I tried to steer us back on course. Um, <laughs> but I the dabs kicked in. <laughs> <laughs> I will say I was not happy with last week's, uh, last week's episode. Neither was Tanner. Uh, and I apologize because I want us to be as excellent. Every show is incredibly important to Greg and I. Cat, too. Uh, but Who? It, it, you're right. Oh, it, shit. Sorry. And, and everybody who is involved in We Are Libertarians takes this very seriously, except Bittner. And, uh, we, I don't take anything seriously. I know, that's true. Um, we, we do take this kind of criticism seriously. We're not going to change the first 20 minutes. Maybe we could cut it. We could just do interviews with libertarian luminaries and just give you current events analysis, and we could probably grow quicker. But it's not going to have the same effect uh, where, where you would look forward to every episode like you do when we try and trick Tanner into thinking that he spilled a beer, or James and Tanner talk about... Uh, Hank Hill being a cuck. Hank Hill being a cuck. Uh, when, when we talk about the f listeners' favorite moments on the show, those are the things that come up. You don't remember our opinion on North Korea. You remember Tanner being tricked into thinking he spilled a beer. 
So we, we do try Or that to, he even was on the podcast. Because he doesn't remember. <laughs> um, but t- Tanner is fine, by the way. Tanner is okay, and it was much... Fine strong. Fi- fi- Tanner's... Tanner. Tanner's Tanner. He's going to be okay. We're big brothering the shit out of him right now. So, so I do want everybody to, to not worry too much about him. But do want everybody to know that uh, we, we constantly are talking about the, the, the balance between... You know, the the, yeah. the comedy portion and the politics portion. Our target market's a little bit higher up the funnel of libertarianism. We're trying to draw people in, and then we pass them off down to more serious outlets. Someone like Tom Woods, we could never be. We're not Columbia PhDs and never will be. Nope. They're students of history, or he's a student of history that's kind of unmatched. And so the more we would try to be like him, the worse we'd fail, and the less popular we'd probably be. And honestly, if you're going to get cr- constructive criticism, I don't know about you, Chris, but I have no problem apologizing for my length. I have absolutely no problem in that area. I mean, no it's one, something we hear all the time. You guys are so long, and nobody, so we are. Nobody, but we're, we are sorry, but there's not a lot we can do. You're, you just are constantly, you guys are just overpowering, and it is, uh, it's, it's just the stamina that this podcast has. <laughs> we will push a little less hard right. on, on, on our length. Right, but no, we won't. No, we <laughs> never will apologize for the thickness of our opinions <laughs> and the length of our podcast or how deep how deep we go in we, the issues. we go very right. deep exactly and sometimes you know we touch bottom and we it hurts right sometimes you got to tip a cervix <laughs> uh now morgan how wet are you right now <laughs> she just very. made a peanut gallery comment i'd like to hear that publicly <laughs> what did you say I, I said i was aroused yes honestly i mean how could you not be with the length of this libertarian podcast yeah but um, Nathan, thank yeah, you for taking the time to write us in because the fact that you would spend that much time and thought uh, into writing such a, g- a positive, uh, constructive criticism, we much appreciate and only hope to hear more and hope to improve and do better. Yeah, that's why so we end every episode with "We promise to do better next time" because we sincerely mean it. Yeah, we are. Are we, are we done? Yep. Oh. oh, all right. Awesome. Look what you did, Nathan. You little jerk. Here's your opinion. Made it way shorter. Thank and you. And I'm tossing it in the garbage. You want a shotgun one? You're doing a good job so far. <laughs> she will. Never I've never seen someone before. chug a bottle of Moscato. <laughs> yeah, no, no this that's is a not true. dollars well. bottle, so it's it's nice. Oh, I mean, you kind of. you bonged it in one gulp. That was impressive. The last time somebody did that was Caitlin Kopetsky when she, after this podcast, was so drunk on Moscato that she danced to Genuine's Pony. Uh, <laughs> So yeah. we, yeah, so we do, we are always trying to improve. So if you ever have constructive criticism on how we can make the show better, we will listen. Uh, we have figured out a formula that is uh, making us one of the top libertarian podcasts. I mean, we're, we're up in the top five at this point in terms of numbers, and we're coming for number one. Uh, we self-identify as number one. Absolutely. We tell you we're number one. Uh, I want to thank everybody who donates to the show, people who donate via PayPal or Patreon at WeAreLibertarians.com. I counted it up when I sent an email earlier thanking those people. 103 people in the history of We Are Libertarians have uh, been a monthly contributor, donated a one-time, or become an advertiser. People like uh, Alex Ramon, Aaron Jones, Aaron Harding, uh, Eric Neff, Dustin Reed, Craig DaCosta has, uh, you know, thanks to Craig DaCosta, Jason Doolittle, uh, Christy Avery, um, you know, Austin Broderson, you guys especially recently have really come through and helped me as I've uh, bought some software that's going to help us approve the We Are Libertarians uh, website and a few projects that we're working on, including a membership site to thank people like Jason Doolittle and Jennifer, Jennifer Himmelberg and Jeremiah Morrill and Jordan Laycock and... Uh, Wait, it doesn't feel like you gave Jer his full due <clears throat> there for being a monthly contributor. I did. I mean, he has... He has an actual giving level right. named after him. He does. And you just kind of like swept his name under there the... There was a tone with there was the definite. There was a definite tone. Well... Uh, it reeked of anti-Semitism. <laughs> uh, I just... I can't help but love Kirk French and Kelly Cur- Curran and Josh Neitz and Joseph T- Tarner and Stacey Perkins. They're all so, so great. Even Sarah Potter, who is a member of the Jeremiah Morrill Pizza Society, which is a monthly contribution of $7... So we will never forget the time that Jared got mad at me for something that was not my fault. Uh, when he made me <laughs> give my last $7 to my name to him as he forced friendship on me, Uh-oh. made me go to Giacomo's and get pizza with him, and then was insulted. After, he poverty shamed you. After I told mm. him three times, listen, bro, I only have $7. And he goes, when I handed it to him, he goes, you're serious? I was like, yeah. 
Sorry about that $30 pizza. You wanted me to come. So <laughs> shekels in Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. I am uh I'm impressed. The the records you have here are are better than what you had when you were running the Libertarian Party. Absolutely. <laughs> that's because we have a database. Trigger. <laughs> we have we have actual software now. That, that's actually not as much of an indictment on him as as the pain that we kind of mutually went through. Yeah. Some of that. <laughs> so Joe, You're indentured servitude, so to speak. Joe Benavidez. Uh, listen, if I say your last name, I'm gonna get it wrong. Andre, it's Benavidez. Andre Andre Myrick, Ken Walker, Eric Anderson, uh, Toby Stoltz Fuss, Ryan Graham. You guys are awesome. Todd Singer especially, and Rick Irvine helped donate to uh, close the gap on some of the, uh, the the membership software that I had to buy and the new templates and all that stuff. So thank you to those guys. Thank you. I didn't mention everybody's name, but you guys are all-stars, and it's, uh, it's very much appreciated, uh, unlike whispering in the middle of a radio program. Now, we... <laughs> Uh, can you please text like a normal <laughs> 21-year-old Morgan? Wait, what I, do you mean? I know he's like 43 and probably doesn't know. He can't, I can't wish he was 43. You yeah. can reach him at brett at bittner at compuserve.com. <laughs> <laughs> <Right. laughs> hey, well hey wait, wait. I'm not Sam Goldstein. That's true. Guys. That's true. The technology chair of the National Party. <laughs> Has an AOL account. So. Twenty four ninety nine a month, hell of a deal. <laughs> <laughs> if you uh, send your AOL email discs to Sam Goldstein, he can get a great deal. Uh, we make fun of him he because can, he keeps uh, cut you a deal us. on insurance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So a deal. <laughs> so now let's get into the uh, current events. If only something major had been going on even, in America right I now. I haven't heard anything. Something has been happening. I know. Has there been- I, I haven't I haven't seen the news. I mean, I, we could talk about the trade bill that's trying to make it through and infrastructure improvements, but I feel like you know I don't know what I don't know that this is going to be an easy sell. No, we're in full scale uh, race wars at this point. Um, we, <laughs> we <laughs> and there a, we go. Wow, we got a race war going on, and not the Fast and the Furious version. Uh, essentially, we're going <laughs> to discuss today how did the most multicultural, <laughs> multi ethnic generation in history end up in a full scale race war? I don't know how we got here, but we're there, and I think it's uh, it's it's a really interesting topic. We were going to talk. I blame Greg. We had planned. We've been working on a series where we're going to go through and define. The political movements, we're going to define certain policies and, and really kind of give you a an in-depth look in, into the libertarian movement, the republic, the, the conservative. conservative movement, how po- how different policies work. So it's just going to be a very clean, very simple look. And Matt did a ton of hard work. Your notes were fantastic, <laughs> yeah. by the way, and I so appreciate it. Like, I, they were outstanding. Matt spent so very much autistic. time working <laughs> much on this. Much screeching. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> And then somebody <laughs> drove a charger into a group of black people. It was a challenger, <laughs> I'll have you know. Anybody can have a charger. Challengers, though. <laughs> now, it, uh, I don't even know where to begin. So let's start with I what... I believe it was an Ohio man, too, yeah. as well, that it was, was driving that challenger. An Ohio man. That's right, because they checked star. the registration. Yeah. Uh, 4chan OH. weaponized all over it and pulled up the public documents and then said that didn't have a sunroof and immediately thought it was a conspiracy. So essentially, a group called Unite the Right was organized by Jason Kessler, and uh, he, he a few days ago, organized this rally, and he's an alt-right person. Um, alt-right. He's, a, he's a radical traditionalist, I think, is how he defines himself. Right. Let's, let's define some of these terms because there's a lot of different movements. When we say alt-right, what exactly is alt right? That's where you press the alt button and the right, right arrow, right? Thank yes. you. And then take, take your puns. <laughs> <laughs> take your puns and try to dodge the dodge. <laughs> this is really not funny, Greg. We shouldn't be joking like this. I know it's too soon. But too the soon. meme, but the memes, man. Uh, memes have been so no, good. but uh, so I mean the alt rights. It's not clearly defined by any means because if if you believe the opposition, then you can lump um, the president's strategic advisor Steve Bannon into the alt-right as sort of the founder and spearheaded um, he's not the philosophical leader by any means but he's clearly someone I don't mean to interrupt Greg but is that a tiki torch out there on Spengel's patio? Yes. <laughs> Just checking. See, pretty, these are the, pretty well used, too. Huh? Just checking. <laughs> these are the tan genitals that people are talking about. <laughs> First they come for the Nazis, then the party members. Uh, no, but so Steve Bannon would be someone who, if you believe the opposition, he is the titular head, the unappointed head mm-hmm. of the alt-right, and someone that is a, um, kind of a unavow- or unapologetic 
ethno-nationalist, I guess you could say. He's absolutely a radical nationalist, and for the first time in American politics in our lifetimes, it's the first time someone's experienced that. But you would have to go back to um, Paul Gottfried would probably yes. be the first real mainstream <clears throat> alt-right philosophical founder, wouldn't you agree? He's the, he's the first to have, uh, from my reading, used the term Alt right, yeah. right, and and he falls into the paleo conservative wing yeah. of the uh, conservative movement. He's someone who he didn't get hit by the John Birch fallout of the Republican redefinition in the fifties and sixties, but he definitely wasn't um, easily. People didn't associate with him very willingly. Right. So a lot of con the cons when conservatism got redefined, a lot of people fell out mm -hmm. of the mainstream after Goldwater's election. That were a lot of the Goldwater caucus. They were the people who their famous ad against Goldwater. This isn't my Republican Party. And so Gottfried sort of kept that ragtag band of misfit toys together in the right, and they became the alternative right. And then Richard Spencer came along and really popular, popularized the term. He owned the name. He, he came and said, this is, this is what it is. And he basically said, if you don't follow him, you're not alt-right. Exactly. Like it's an exclusive club. He owns it. Right. He owns it. And the thing is, they have been much more willing to associate, include, and court organizations that are public, publicly, you know, admittedly uh, Nazi sympathetic at minimum and pro and actual <laughs> so, Nazis at, so at their maximum. So groups like Stormfront and a Daily Storm League of the is South. Is it Daily Stormer? Daily Stormer Storm is, the Daily newspaper. is the newspaper. I won't allow you to throw League of the South in there. That's a hate organization by the Southern Law and Poverty Center, but so is Charles Murray. <laughs> so. You don't get to just toss that in there because you're friends with the national chair. Oh, we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. Oh, we'll wait. The League of the, the, League of the South, the League of the South is, uh, you know, someone that believes the Civil War was a war of Northern aggression. Mm -hmm. there, there, that seems to be kind of the, the thread. Like, when you talk about this Jason Kessler who started the Unite the Right rally. His, He's not all that different than Jack, um, the Southern Avenger, Jack uh, What's Hunter. his face? Jack Hunter. Yeah. yeah. He's not that much different than him. He was another League of the South member. Mm -hmm. See yeah. when he has that douchey smile on his face? Like, what? It wasn't all that long ago the Libertarian movement, and especially Liberty Republicans, claimed Jack Hunter, and he worked for Rand Paul. He did. He did. Yeah. Yep. Now, Ron After Paul, being the Southern Now, Avenger. Jeffrey Tucker once ghost wrote some beautiful newsletters for Ron Paul that were used to fundraise. Right. Are you sure that it was I Jeffrey don't think Tucker? It was Tucker. I'm, oh, yeah. Mm. Okay. I'm, I'm pointing the finger. You Could heard we, it here first. I've got the documents. Right. <laughs> I've if been through the, the compressed the, data. <laughs> now, if you've got the documents. Uh, now, Morgan, please pick up that microphone. Yes. How do you deal with the passive aggressiveness? <laughs> because... <laughs> I was just over here I, smiling. I, I call I call him out on it a lot because it's it's rather annoying, you know. He acts like he knows something that you don't, you know. Right. And it's like I I doubt it. As, <laughs> as the only person in this like room, states rights, who's actually met Jack Hunter. Yes, the Southern Avenger. The Southern Avenger. So yeah. that makes you racist. <laughs> oh, okay. Basically. By association. I mean, by association. Guilty Got by it. association, Brett. He knows Tom Woods. That's what I heard. Right. I heard he's... <laughs> Woods to Hunter, Hunter to Bittner. <laughs> I can add these things up. <laughs> we'll get there. Let's, let's yeah, focus. Yeah, we'll get there. So, okay, focus. so focus. So, so the, the alt-right is, specif is specifically... A, they've become... They've started identifying themselves as classical traditionalists. A traditional way... They adhere to the customs they believe made the United States great, and more so than Wait, those principles, the American skin color. Again? No, not necessarily. Okay. They're not that's not that's not their goal. Their goal is they feel like they're under attack by cultural change. So, they are a natural result of feeling up, oppressed by multiculturalism and what they perceive to be radical change in things in gender and um hell reassignment surgeries. I mean, they feel like they're under attack because they very much adhere to a Judeo-Christian worldview. And yet, instead of taking those principles, they take away that it's the skin color that makes it preferable rather than the principles that make it preferable and allow the United States to succeed. They, t they draw the, long, the wrong lessons. And as they feel more, as people start to threaten to tear down monuments, um, as the city council voted to democratically remove, and, and they even renamed the park that it's in, right? Do you guys, mm -hmm. what was, do you know what it was named before? By no. chance in Charlottesville? Uh, no, I don't It's know. Emancipation Park now. <clears throat> Um, but that was that one doc or that uh, proclamation that Lincoln made declaring a war property. Um, but but only in the eleven states that he didn't have any control over at the co time. Correct, correct. Sort of like a uh, 
I guess you could say a state chair over his county chairs in the LPIN, a state proclamation, <laughs> and then they all make the decision collectively. Formerly but, Lee Park. Yeah, Lee Park. Yeah, it oh, was, was it? It was, it was, Robert, e. It was Lee Park. Robert E. Lee Park, yeah. Who Interesting. Was, to That's be, kind of a thorn in the eye for a public park. T- TBH, he was less racist than Abraham Lincoln. Agreed. So, Well, history remembers it differently. Right. Yep. I know, but he was. He was less racist than... Did you know that when I lived in Alabama, I found out that MLK Day is also Robert E. Lee Day? Really? Yeah. It's like IUPY. It's the same holiday. Was it started in like the 60s as an e 50, type? 60s, yeah. Yeah. As like it, was to remind, it was to remind black people of their place. Put them in the place, yeah. And, and, the, and the same reason, I mean, it was the same impetus that you saw a lot of the statues that we see that right. are now being taken down, a lot of the memorials, a lot of the, the things, the parks. Yeah. Um, the battle flags, for things. example. Um, you saw that in my former home, uh, the state of Georgia used to have the Confederate battle flag as part of theirs um, starting in 1956 until sure. uh, Roy Barnes's uh, first term or only term as governor. Yeah. Was the, he a Republican or Democrat? Democrat. He was the last Democrat. So he was the ones that didn't write Jim Crow. Sure. <laughs> well, the so, Democrats were Jim Crow. The, so essentially... Lincoln freed their slaves. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the monuments for a minute before we get yeah. to this because I'm for turning these all into gravel. To be honest, like, I don't know if you saw Mitchell Andrews speech, which is, I think, one of the best speeches in this decade uh, where he talked about the removal. He's the mayor of New Orleans, and he talked about the removal of these statues in New Orleans and essentially said, yeah, they are Southern heritage, but this is a heritage that we shouldn't celebrate. This is the denial of freedom and liberty for 400 years for a group of human beings that were systematically murdered and then once freed continued to be systematically murdered and then these were instituted in in public squares with to publicly re- do- public tax with dollars public tax dollars to remind black people that they were still second class citizens and they are actually symbols of the south's white supremacist heritage and therefore they shouldn't be on public land if you want to build white supremacist symbols then build them on your own private land but as for the mayor of uh the mayor and the city council they're tearing them down and they're taking Mm -hmm. them out and you know i didn't really have an opinion on it because i love history and i look at it and i go i don't know i haven't really thought of this this seems controversial i don't want to deal with this right now but then i watched that 20 minute speech uh we posted it on we are libertarians facebook page you can also get it uh, on on youtube just look up mitch landrew L A N D R I E U, and it's a it's a fantastic speech, and I think that it will it will do for you what it did for me. It gave me a a a, 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 a prosecutorial uh, mindset towards these statues, and definitely left me without reasonable doubt that they should be torn down. So the only the only issue that I took with the way that uh, Landrew and others have talked about the statues is they only focus on some. Um, and I see this as we, we basically have two um, ways to go. One, we're going to see that this is a slippery slope and mm-hmm. we're going to start removing statues of, say, Thomas Jefferson and sure. George Washington, who owned slaves. Right. Um, despite them having been some of the leaders in, in changing the culture, um, in they were very America. progressive for that era. They were very progressive for that context, era. Context, you're you're just, you're stuck and by your context, context of the tough. area you're in. So so, right. and but then you also have and and this is the thing for me that that really strikes is that should we really be glorifying anyone for their perceived leadership for their? I mean, let's face it, we have hmm. statues of Lenin in Seattle. Yes, um, and that the, that I are, think that's as offensive as any statue you could build uh, in the United and, States. And so, so However, for me, I mean, there you have are those two competing paths that we can go down. We can either take them all down, which I'm actually in favor of the idea of no longer utilizing the state to reinforce uh, the history the that the state wants. Yeah, right. The, because eventually, what you're going to see is that you're going to see a rewriting of history. Yeah, and whitewashing of history. If sure. you if you allow only certain things to be removed, but I also see that you know I remember the cheering 
um, when I was in a, a restaurant or bar when the, the big Saddam Hussein statue yep. in Iraq was toppled mm -hmm. by the American troops. And so I'm thinking about it in a very similar context. If we just took them all away, then we wouldn't have to worry about the messages that we're sending. Uh, we wouldn't have to worry about virtue signaling. We wouldn't have to worry about whitewashing history because we wouldn't have the state determining for us what our history should be, and we can actually learn for ourselves what it actually is. Mm -hmm. Matt? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we can look. I saw, uh, uh, as, as preparing for today, um, Bradley Balco hit my feed, and an article he wrote a little while ago, I think, and, um, you know, in the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, uh, Eastern Bloc countries such as Hungary, Lithuania, special place in my heart, right? I mean, they have taken these statues down. Uh, even in Russia, they have taken these statues down and, you know, relegated them, sometimes to special purposes to help, you know, this is a moment in history and, and it's part of history and, and we shouldn't completely whitewash it away, right? But it's now, you know, I think there is one where there's a statue of, of Lenin, uh, but then also a bunch of like, uh, you know, marble severed heads, right, you know, that symbolize the gulags, right, that was going on. So, you know, I think that is a, you know, a, a great compromise and a great way forward as to how we can continue to, you know, we don't want to forget this history, but, you know, uh, at the same time, you know, proclaiming it and, and promoting it in the public square, um, you know, I can't, I I I hear where, Brett, you're coming from, right, but I mean, let's face it, most of these statues are going to be, we're not talking about you know the Washington Monument here. We're talking about well, we small, we, yeah, <laughs> we're, 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 small public parks and you know towns across America, right? And and so you know I don't think it's appropriate for sweeping, you know, federal legislation to say get rid of it. But I think the right thing to do is for each of these individual uh, well, municipalities well, to make their own decisions. What we could and, do is we could it. sell it to private individuals who want to maintain that history. Absolutely, and that then should you be kill part, two birds with one stone. That we're, should be part of the process. But I, we're still uh, arguing the Ten Commandments. I mean. And, and, yeah. And the Supreme Court has so long decided that the, it, it is a violation of people's religious rights. And even though I'm a Christian, and I think, are you an atheist, Bittner? All left like, libertarians are atheists. All, exactly right. He's Asians. a godless Ooh. commie. No, like, I, I, I mean, if, if you're an atheist, like, I totally get why you wouldn't want public dollars being used to promote the Ten Commandments. Makes total sense to me. I, I agree with you. Like, because I don't need the state to uh, put forth this ideology that they're the protector of religion in America. Like, it's, it's silly. And uh, the, 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 uh, the Thomas Jefferson is one of the greatest authors of liberty. Yes. I mean, he is somebody who, uh, who yes, he had slaves. He freed all of his slaves. He made love to his slaves. He had children with his slaves. He, he, that's, actually, <laughs> that's actually in doubt. Now really? they've done some DNA testing. It looks like it might have been his nephew that was yeah. actually the one who fathered mm. the children with, with Sally Hemings and, mm. and some of her descendants. Yeah, there you go, whitewashing history. And she was a half-sister of Jefferson's wife. Correct. Yes. And it, willed to them when, his, when Martha's husband. father passed. Yeah. So I... It, Society is always evolving, and there there is no excuse for slavery. There's no excuse for the systematic racism of uh, Sheriff Clark in the 1960s against protesters, uh, or or Bull Connor. There is no excuse for any of it. Or Robert Byrd, or, or Robert Byrd, yeah. or, or George Wallace standing in the doors, blocking the entrance right. to the University of Alabama. The Absolutely. the uh, the entire human story is marching towards freedom and and progressing towards freedom and. Our forefathers made mistakes, and they were, uh, in some cases, terrible people, in other ways, complicated people. And I think that part of the beauty of the internet age and the part of the beauty of the millennial age, uh, millennials, is that we're always trying to make society more tolerant, more open, more understanding. But there's always going to be racists. There's always going to be bigots. There's always going to be people on the left or the right or in the libertarian movement or in the conservative movement or wherever or in your office in the the White House. or the White House <laughs> that, that hate other people for right. whatever reason, the color of their skin, their ideology. And, and Pure I, and simple, just how they're raised. And, and no. I, I want to invoke Jeffrey Tucker because I, I took the opportunity to go back and reread his Against Libertarian Brutalism because 
as the uh, one of the le- the starters of these libertarian brutalist groups that Greg became the king of, I closed it. You you literally I decimated it. You decimated it because you were so savage. Sometimes uh, you have to fight fire with fire, and I needed to break apart their hate. So in 2014, in response to this article, a bunch of Facebook groups got started, but where it was like it was just in vogue to say the most offensive thing you possibly could to be, see what the limits were. To see what the limits were, and then, then liberty shamed somebody. Somebody added James Neese, and then he took over the group, mm-hmm. and then he he someone gave him admin rights, and he shut down the main brutalism group. And then they we did change it from the inside. I don't mean to <laughs> they, put a tip of the old cap on this, but it is possible. They fled to another group, and then someone added. Gr- Greg and he started wrestling and then he closed the group and blew it up after he put a, uh, one of the main protagonists child's face on a fleshlight. I asked if there was anything I could do that would upset people. <laughs> they said, you can't do anything that will upset these people. Turns out they were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Making a sex toy out of a child is apparently offensive. I asked. Who knew? I asked. <laughs> who knew? So and It's so- not like I did it without saying, guys, I will accommodate your, you know, weak class jimmies. Just tell me where the boundaries are. So the the uh, Morgan just discovered the uh, Instagram post I made of her as she was trying to decide what to read. So go ahead. You can speak. Do you have a microphone? We were not yeah. anti-FEMA. What, what'd you, I zoomed in on your ass? Yes. No, I was end. zooming in on the bookshelf. No, it was at the end and it was my ass. I was zooming in on Greg. Look at him. Look how cute he is. He wasn't in the frame at all. It was my ass. Well, if you go to our Instagram, you can decide for yourself at We Are Libertarian. <laughs> or go our, to our private this, Facebook let's group. Let's not start uh, protesting and getting out. Uh, Honestly, take your into FIFA ass and get out. <laughs> You're more millennial, though, than any of us, right? So, like, no, clearly she's more she's Gen not Z. A millennial. I'm Gen Z, actually. Yeah. Gen Z. So, but I'm sure that your Facebook feed is entirely different that. than, like, ours. Yeah. Obviously. Well, I use Twitter because I'm not, you know, 35. Yeah, exactly. Use a different platform because you're younger. Right. So, so like on Twitter, old man smell, right, Brett? Exactly. Isn't it annoying when you date a younger woman and she thinks that that hurts your feelings? Wait, that he has an old man smell? No, that you're just the old jokes. Oh. He doesn't have the old man smell. He smells great. He smells like bacon. I I do smell like bacon. That's true. All the time. All the time. Smells like smoked meat and bacon. Honestly, I'm moist. And whiskey. (laughs) And whiskey. whiskey. Yeah, you forgotten you forgot the whiskey. But so like surely your twit like so that your Twitter stream is wildly uh, different composition than ours. What has like for you, and you're not necessarily libertarian, what are your thoughts on this whole uh, fiasco? Um I just is it like mass outrage at all points from everyone in your age group? Basically, yeah. And then you have a few people who um, classify themselves as like Trump supporters, and they're kind of like they're basically like neo Nazis. Not Trump supporters in general, but the people that I'm talking about. Yeah, um, as close to that mic as you can. You talk softly. Okay. Sorry. Is it's this okay. okay? Yeah, okay. that's good. Um, but for for me, my take on this is um, with the with tearing down the statues. It's kind of like in Germany, they don't have you know statues to commemorate the holocaust it's so. a crime to do seek hail yeah so. and it's also a crime to sing the first verse of uh, deutschland uber alles. is it really yeah. mm. oh. so I, I kind of um i hadn't thought about the whole like tax dollar perspective and that's why i hang out with liber- libertarians because you know um and their memes are fire yeah that too um so i think that that's definitely an interesting perspective and i yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of like just if people really want those statues, let them let them buy them, let them take care of them themselves, and just you know. Are you okay with community decision making on it? If it's community mm-hmm. level funding and decision making, or no? No, not really, because um, there there's going to be people like. What if the community is just like the majority is white racist. and they're racist and there's like enough black people that it they don't but they don't get to make a decision on it it's just kind of like Wait, you that's mean the problem direct with democracy, democracy doesn't work basically yeah the god I, that failed yeah physical removal so that so that's something you would oppose then too so yeah. you really would primarily agree with like let's put them up sell them private if to any private buyer mm-hmm. and um rather than having any memorials or any type of statutes that are publicly funded by the collective uh, make it where they're d- private donations and uh, housed in private locations. 
Yeah, because I think that in a way that contains um, some of the racism and the only way that you really can is let the racist be racist and try to keep them to themselves. Right. Actually, I'd, I'd like to jump in to follow up what she said. You know, you're actually seeing in Atlanta and in the state of Georgia where they're talking about sandblasting. Um, Stone Lee, Mountain. Stonewall Jackson, uh, Alexander Stevens, and uh, Jefferson Davis off of Stone Mountain uh, because it is a public... It is a government-owned park. Is it, is it federal Previous, or state? Honestly, state. wouldn't it be cheaper just to erect a statue of Sherman? Previously. <laughs> previously, oh, it was a, so much cheaper. It was, a, it, was a private, it was a private park, and then they... they it became, then it got... They actually acquired it and then used public funds to subsidize the, the Mount Rushmore, the Confederacy. And so, basically, what you could do is go the opposite way, just sell it back off. But they're talking about now uh, legislation to clear the carving off of Stone Mountain. With public um, funds? With public funds because it is a publicly, or with taxpayer funds because it is a taxpayer. Honestly, I don't think you'd ever find a donor who would, you couldn't do a GoFundMe or Kickstarter who would do pay for the sandblasting of Stone Mountain, I would guess. Uh, you might be able Maybe to Maybe Bezos. It. Or someone like yeah. you know, Gates or somebody like that. Well, so let me circle Soros back. actually. Yeah, let me That's let me circle back. Let me circle Nazi. back to to some of the brutalism stuff because one of the main characters in all this was Chris Cantwell, who was the founder of these brutalist groups where everybody was encouraged. Prominent to... LARPer in New Hampshire. Major LARPer hung out with a lot of uh, people, but is just an all around intolerable human being. And I don't know how people were ever friends with him. I found him to be gross and intolerable. He was somebody who lived in his van. Uh, you know, for somebody who's in the alt-right, he had a gay phase and was openly gay for a while, I think. <gasps> Which is fine, but, like, put that on your on your signs as you march with all these Nazis. <laughs> Make like, that a threat on Daily Stormer. Right. Like, the... <laughs> You know, he mocked uh, when this one guy uh, was arrested for child molestation who was a prominent member in the libertarian movement, like, said the worst thing that he put in his daughter was oh, his boy. leftist ideology. Like, yeah, that's a post that I put on the We Are Libertarians Facebook group accessible on WeAreLibertarians.com. You know, I've tried to distance us from the Free State Project for a very long time for a reason. Uh, listen, I didn't want us showing up in a Vice documentary. There's great people, and there's, you know, there's Roger Paxton, and then there's this dude. And I, I've just, I've never heard him talk. He talks like a, such a weirdo. And, Wait, uh, I, just to be clear, is Roger Paxton one of the good people? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Yes, he's I, the kind white supremacist. I, I wasn't sure. <laughs> I wasn't totally sure if kidding. you were angling totally for kidding. a new public apology, so I was just trying no, no, to no, no. Out. I, I actually have become a monthly contributor on his Patreon to the Lava Flow. Excellent podcast. After he shamed you into it. No, no, he donated to us for a while. Now I'm donating okay. to Roger, and I'm donating cross subsidy to Lions of Liberty. I'm donating to Jen Gray at Leading Liberty and our. Oh, friend, are you? Jen, shut up. Jen, uh, J now Johnny Rocket Launchpad, who has a great new comic book called The Liberty Force. Can't recommend it enough. It's fantastic. Forward by Tom Woods. I was going to ask who the forward was by. So you can you can go check that out if you want. It's a really cool comic book available at johnnyrocketlaunchpad.com. Uh, yeah, give the uh, comic book to the child and let her read it over. Now, wow. Jeffrey Tucker wrote an article in 2014 can just google against libertarian brutalism and this set the world the libertarian world on fire and started all these groups get super before any of us really got there uh, he writes suggest that libertarians can generally be divided into two camps, the humanitarians and brutalists. The humanitarians are drawn to reasons such as the following. Liberty allows peaceful human cooperation and inspires the creative service of others. It keeps violence at bay. It allows for capital formation and prosperity. It protects human rights of all against invasion. It allows human associations of all sorts to flourish on their own terms. It socializes people with rewards toward getting along rather than tearing each other apart and leads to a world in which people are valued as ends in themselves rather than fodder in the central plan. We all know this from history and experience. These are all great reasons to love liberty. But they are not the only reasons that people support liberty. 
There is a segment of the population which self-described libertarians describe here as brutalists who find all of the above rather boring, broad, and excessively humanitarian. To them, what's impressive about liberty is that it allows people to assert their individual preferences to form homogenous tribes, to work out their biases in action, to ostracize people based on politically incorrect standards, quote unquote, to hate to their heart's content so long as no violence is used as a means, which is exactly word for word what Chris Cantwell said in that Vice documentary. We're not aggressive, but if you're aggressive toward us, we will right. effing kill you. And to shut down people based on their demographics or political opinions, to be openly racist and sexist, to exclude and isolate and be generally malcontented with modernity, and to reject civil standards of values and etiquette in favor of antisocial norms. Gosh, I wonder who he's talking about there. These two impulses are radically different. And I think that he beautifully captures what you see about Chris Cantwell and the other alt-right people that were featured in the Vice documentary that uh, has gone viral. I'll look up the title and, and let you guys know what it is, but... Charlottesville so, it, like, uh, something? Y yeah, exactly. Uh, I posted it on my Facebook. But, I mean, in, in, uh, the takeaway from that is that I don't identify with anybody who was in Charlottesville. I don't identify with the left. I don't identify with the right. I don't in identify with the reporter. You she, wanted to date she, the documentary maker, let's be clear. She was weird. She was one of those mousy liberals that you just love. I'm into it. Charlottesville, <laughs> Charlottesville Race and Terror, Vice News Tonight on HBO. Y yeah, like it was very, um, you know, just like the, the, like the left after the car thing was just so over the top and ridiculous. And the people like Chris Cantwell couldn't have been more of a disgusting human being. Like he would just gives me the willies. And like all these guys are just gross. And Usually I'm so, you know, when I see somebody that lives in a van, I'm just like, look at this guy. Right. You know, this is an impressive individual. But he <laughs> just totally destroyed the stereotype I've had of van living people. The, the old dude from the Daily Stormer was pretty. He oh was my so God. Crazy. When he yeah. said we, we've, we've effectively organized our memes, I about jumped out of my chair because I thought, oh my God. He, he, we've taken the internet and gone viral now. We're in real life. Like it was so crazy. Meme magic. But and it, and I had a conversation. I met my first KKK Nazi member at a at a, a guy named Andy who went to the Charlottesville rally. Who I met in Martinsville, Indiana. Those from Indiana will, will <laughs> of all the gin right. joints in all the world. Right. Uh, and Andy is uh, a very bright man, but also someone who is completely incapable of participating in society in any effective way. Somebody who is uh, a dangerous person, but only when he gets out of control and has a psychic break in a mob mentality he's somebody who is violently you know abused in so many different ways over the course of the years and he's just generally a terrible awful person and he's pathetic like he's a de pathetic degenerate and when i walked away from that experience meeting my first nazi member kkk member i went why am i afraid of these guys they're pathetic and when i watched that i saw those same people marching in charlottesville who are just pathetic. And when I, when I talk to people who are friends and identify with the alt-right, I go, uh, walk me through what you believe. Pitch me. Pitch me. And when that happens, when I actually engage in a dialogue with these people, I go, oh, well, you can tell me you're not a white supremacist, but you're clearly saying things that, like, Haiti's a defective country because it's run by black people and not whites. Like, well, that means that you think black people are defective degenerates and you're a white supremacist. Like, the very ideology that you espouse is racism and superiority because of skin color, which is just fucking retarded. So wait, what you're saying is that people can have a belief system and not actually identify as something but could still be that something? I don't know what you mean, Bittner. Explain yourself. There could be a white black supremacist like Clayton Bigsby. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, <laughs> no. <laughs> Bittner's doing the Bittner. He's just say it, dude. The art of the Bittner? <laughs> right. No, I, I mean, I'm just pointing out that you, you identified somebody who doesn't self-identify as a white supremacist, but when you look at their belief system, it's clear that that is what they believe, but they don't have the balls to come out and say it. Is there anything that you'd like to say to the audience, Brett? I'm Would you like to confess anything? No. We know you're from Georgia. Nothing at all. We know you're from Georgia. We know that you Not are... all slave owners are white. Brett. Someone... <laughs> so... I'm standing up here. I'm uh -huh. championing your cause. Yeah. Would you also... Agree... You love sweet tea. You sit mint juleps. You wear a white suit and sit on your front porch. But see, I'm isn't... just saying... 
isn't it weird, Brett, that when it's I was sucker. saying Thank you very much. Uh, oh, it's after Labor Day, of course. When, of course. I was saying that if you get a platform to espouse their ideas and then you end up exposing them, <laughs> you agreed with that premise. Then that it doesn't necessarily associate you by guilt. You seem to agree with that. You also earlier in the program, might I add in for a future discussion, <laughs> um, basically went along the lines of saying that uh, you shouldn't judge people by every choice they made in their past because history is complicated. You seem to, you seem to, I wish I had, I didn't have a cat in my face because then I would uh, explain what you said exactly. Is that the thing but you wrote down? When I have a cat in my face, I just get so. <laughs> So uh, I just want to grab it, and I don't know don't, why. Yes, don't don't touch it, Bittner. You're allergic. She'll no, go. I, have, she, I took my. You head. took your Claritin. Okay, no, please. Zizol, by the way, works way. All right. Uh, you probably never heard good. of it. Oh, yeah, she is going to bite you so hard, Morgan. She is not happy. Oh. Oh. She's she's actually Adolf Mittler. Oh, look <laughs> look at, look at the poster behind you. Yeah, yep. she's very very sure. racist. Not not a fan of. Harry at all. <laughs> well, I mean, what's the point? So are we saying that the all... I, I am at the point where I would just go ahead and say that the Unite the Right rally was, at the end of the day, a white supremacy rally. I don't think cla radical traditionalist is remotely... I mean, unless you're referring to the Confederacy, so then... So so Chris shared a good uh, uh, the podcast uh, into the, Lions into the, in and, sorry yeah. Lions of Liberty podcast and I listened to it on the way here um, and there was an independent reporter who was there on the ground in Charlottesville and uh, you know it, it sounds like there certainly were elements who were not truly white supremacists uh, Augustus Invictus was there who, well okay that doesn't count really isn't he a party member <laughs> yes uh, I believe no. he officially quit. Oh, okay. Yeah, he, he has resigned his membership and is running for the U.S. Senate nomination in Florida as a Republican against Rick Scott in the primary for 2018. I'm sure he'll do wonderfully. Well. I'm sure he will. Um, but no, but so the, I, I believe there were elements of the broad, quote, Unite the Right coalition who probably do not deserve to be thrown into the fascist, racist, white supremacist, nationalist, etc. bucket. However, when you stand uh, that close, you're, you're standing awful close. And, and, you know, the other thing that strikes me, and again, we'll, we'll kind of come to some of this a little bit later in the conversation, I think. But, you know, Gottfried himself still kind of takes the term alt-right. Right. I mean, he. Oh, yeah, he doesn't and, and, disavow it whatsoever. And he's, and, but, you know, he uh, phrases it in, in the most recent thing I heard as, you know, just a, a smear. It's become now a smear to describe the entire independent right. In other words, right. the non establishment right. And, and so there is a lot of that out there. And they're more prevalent than ever. They're more prevalent than ever. That group is by far the group that, you know, if you want to talk about tr who Trump is empowering, that actually wields political power, that, that is definitely a group that does. It's Stephen Miller. As well, bad as Steve no, Bannon is, Steve Miller... No, Miller is worse, Him and Richard dude. Spencer co-chaired oh, the sorry, Dirt Conservative. I'm sorry, I got Miller and Spencer confused. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. So yes. they were co-chairs of that, and yes. they have been... And they have been doing... The, they're, they're white supremacy hipsters. They've been doing this way before it was electable or cool in America. And he... I mean, the anti-immigrant stance originates from Stephen Miller. Sure. Well, I mean, there's 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 a long history of uh, xenophobia in the U.S. Oh yeah, I just mean with the, it, that became like a lot of yeah. Trump's platform. He had, I mean, a huge hand in authoring and really putting together the terminology and the defense sure. of it by turning it into a "Why do you hate American workers?" Exactly. Like we did with Jim Acosta. Yeah. Jim. Jim. <laughs> You know, I mean, he's your cosmopolitan worldview. I mean, he's even using terminology that dates back to the Soviet Union and anti-Bolshevism. Right. right. You know, this guy is a class, a radical traditionalist, if there is one. And this is, I mean, he, he's, he doesn't talk about his affiliation <laughs> with Spencer, clearly, because then the president would have to do even more disavowing if that's even possible at this point. But, I mean. Well, he'd just say more things about both sides. Right, right. Well, I mean, Antifa's just as bad. Those are, you know, those are. They originate. They originate in um, post Hitler, and they were every bit as radical and awful in Germany after yeah, Hitler as, the, as Italy, the right actually, are. Right, right along the, the yeah, yeah, those are the OG fascists. Who is it? Franco? Yeah, anti was it Franco in Spain? That, yeah, yes. Franco. Yeah, yeah. Franco's in Spain. Yeah, and so I mean, a lot of these anti anti fascists that you know came came around in the 30s and 40s, you know, is really when they hit their peak. They they were the resistance, and they were yes. the radical anti-resistance in the form of violence. You know, they were going to put a 
bat to the skull of the fascists they hated. And so it's natural that when violence begets violence. And yeah, so exactly. it's only time, mm-hmm. it was only time before they arrived here, really. Yeah. Let's be clear. And honestly, when you look at the way they dress and the way they behave. These are not people to worry about. Yeah. Like when I watched the Vice documentary, I just was like, okay, these are all freaks. All of these people are freaks. The anti They're left, marginalized, these, outraged, Occupy type people on both sides with different, you know, ideologies. You, you, I, like, I don't know about you, Brett. Like, did you, did you see the Vice thing? I haven't. You no. haven't? Okay. Oh, boy, you have to. You yeah, have to. If yeah, I've ever seen an endorsement for the Free State Project, it is that. It, <laughs> would you leave them alone? <laughs> I'm telling you, Free Talk Live, it was basically porn for them. No, it, it was absolutely as atrocious as anything I've ever seen. It, they're, they're just despicable, gross people, but they're if like... If you have any affiliation or have ever been on the record of supporting Chris Cantwell... Oh, boy, did your chickens come home to roost. <laughs> Man, am I glad Maya's not around anymore. <laughs> Precisely. Yeah. Um, it, it just, because Tucker nailed it. Like, I want to be around humanitarians. I want to, I want, the, the people that come on this podcast, you know, for a time we let those kind of people on who, who were part of that. Because what we try to do is understand every aspect of the libertarian movement and the world. But I just am at a point in, in my uh, life where I don't want to surround myself with people who are not trying to make themselves better and humanity better. They're looking for a justification to seclude themselves away from people they don't like. Absolutely. And that like, was what I noticed after the brutalism split is yeah. they became the, – the hardcore brutalists became alt-right, and they did so quickly. They, yeah. they got radicalized very quickly on forums like 4chan and 8chan, on the poll, poll board specifically – and what started out as people who claimed to be black and yellow in the name of hating government all of a sudden became radical traditionalists trying to preserve the invasion of multiculturalism and political correct behavior. Mm-hmm. Cultural Marxist revolution, anti-cultural right. Marxist revolutionaries in the name of skin color, though, not in the name of principle. Right. And so to me, that when you, when you spend all this time trying to claim, well, it's about the application of force, and then the second all of a sudden it becomes not taboo to start saying things that were, you attach your cart to that horse and then just go down the rabbit well, or the, uh, rabbit, the hole, rabbit, rabbit hole. hole. I mean, I mean, well works too. Or yeah, sorry. When you go down, when you go down the, uh, the when you go down the free state rabbit hole, <laughs> <laughs> no, and they became radicalized quickly and are unapologetic and very vocal on Facebook and a lot of other internet platforms. It was stunning because that to me exposed left liberal split within the party and the Free State Project and a lot of the movement because the second they had the chance to attach their cart to racism, they did. And Absolutely. then they had an intellectual defense for it. And I would say that um, Adam Kokesh is on deck. Uh, I'm just I'm calling it here. Uh, he's the next to join the alt-right. He's so, a Russian plant. So I, I don't feel like before we dive into the Libertarian Party split, because it, it all this seeped into the LP and the Libertarian movement at large this week, uh, d- should we talk? There's a theory. There's a lot to talk about. Well, there's a theory going around that uh, this Kessler guy, uh, I saw the Wor- World Net Daily, which is not a credible news source. For, the CNN of Internet sources. Right. It's probably Jerome Corsi reporting live from the scene. Uh, he, he said that he voted for Obama in 2011, and there's a lot of people going around that this <laughs> Kessler guy, uh, who Unite the Right is actually a Soros front, and that he funded this protest. Oh, is that the one about the staffing agency that was hiring political protesters yeah. a week before? Yes, and uh, that this Kessler guy is actually... But it doesn't matter. It, what it he was, did, if it, he did do that, was provide honey to bees. It was clearly tens of thousands. It wasn't tens of thousands. It was hundreds and hundreds of racists. I mean, it was just hundreds and hundreds of Nazi sympathizers I mean, joined. I'd be stunned if there weren't shills within the sure. crowd. Like, uh, but I mean, Bittner is a shill Jr. within the Libertarian Party. Party. A CIA plan. Say right. that, say that, Matt. Is that Bittner is a shill within the Libertarian Party? Absolutely. Right. Nobody's more status than Bittner. Right. <laughs> I like. I do. I just want Bittner to know that we do like you. We no, are. Yeah. We, we are hard uh-huh. on you. Uh-huh. We we're are, very happy you defeated diabetes. <laughs> we're happy that you're alive. What oh, would we so they can our, keep making fun. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Poking then fun. We'd have to go through the process of finding a new person to pick on. It would be. I know. It would be terrible. I offered you a keto podcast. Did I not? Yes, and I've been very lazy and haven't had the opportunity to Well, record, maybe if you had carbs, you'd have energy. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an energy thing. That's not a problem at all. It's a 21-year-old girlfriend thing. I get it. I get it. 
Nothing. It's none of your business. the chili if, capital huh? of the world. If you were paying attention, you'd know. Did you know that Skyline is keto? Skyline is keto. Totally. It's really? like the only chili out there that is. Mm. Because there are no beans. Right. Beans well, aren't keto. Trump deport them. You, you hmm. can't. What? Here we go. Tell us, chili expert. Oh, well, you, you can get the chili with beans. And also, you can't have a... It's a five-way. A, yeah, exactly. You can't have any of the like the spaghetti with the chili, so you can never have right. a three-way well, or four-way. But four then way that's like... A can of chili. Well, wait, wait. That defeats oh, the yeah. skyline. We're talking about chili. Okay, yeah. Yeah. The premise anyway. Yeah, I didn't know where you were going. No, you made the, the valid point that what he does, what he gets at Skyline is really just the topping. With none of yeah. the fixings. Yeah. It's, it's like not getting really cheese skyline. instead of getting yeah. a whole pizza. Right, exactly. Yeah, he just peels the top layer off. <laughs> no, I just don't have him put it in the bowl for me. <laughs> okay. Well, he has them cut up the hot dogs for I do have for, cut up the hot dogs for like him. five. I would... Oh, it's I, embarrassing. Oh, that is so... It's four ninety five. Like, the fact that they're going in there and chopping up your hot dogs. Like, would you like a medium well? <laughs> it's, it's only because the first time I went to order it, like, the lady... At the one in Castleton, did cut them up for me. Oh, she, she offered. Asked. She just did it. That okay? That's so fine. She, she and so the now precedent. she set. you exactly. She set the precedent, and now I have to have them cut up like I'm. Once you go cut, you can never are, go are back. You, are you taking that back to corporate? I I, lo- I hope she will. <laughs> All right, let's circle back. Let's stay on topic. Nathan, Comment Nathan, Nathan is not. right. Uh, okay, so. <clears throat> Oh! oh! Did she just tell you to fuck yourself, Bittner? No, no. not me. Maybe oh. me. That yeah. elo- the author of that eloquent uh, <laughs> constructive criticism. The, the Dear Leader letter. Oh, uh, Nathan? Oh. Listen, I I think... Uh, no comment. It's, a, it's okay. <laughs> it's a, we're used to having uh, there's women a, there's mad a at lot, us. There's a, I mean, a Unite the Right rally that on... One, for them to pretend they are the right is pretty presumptive, wouldn't right. you say? Well, if you yes. listen to the Tom Wood show with uh, who's this guy that you were talking about earlier, the, the Paul Godfrey, Paul so he's Godfrey, a profe- yeah. endowed chair at Elizabeth Th- former. I think he's, yeah, he's no longer there anymore. At all, he's just Mises, I uh, think. Okay. Oh, is he a fellow there too? I believe so. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then he um, has. Written I'm the, shocked. I'm <laughs> shocked. No, I mean, I'm he shocked. wrote. He wrote the what was it? Um, multiculturalism: the politics of fear or shame or something like that. That was really pretty pretty great book. Right. He, he's not a stupid guy by any means. He's a Guggenheim scholar. Um, he received uh, Guggenheim endowment for his um, what contributions to, I want to say political theory or for uh, political commentary, journalist commentary. You know, he he's a guy that if it weren't for him, you would have no idea where this sort of movement formulated and right. how they rallied behind each other and what they cloaked their racism in primarily. Um, and so the the fact that he, that Kessler would, I mean Kessler, is basically a community organizer for the most fringe elements of the American right. And he does a really good job of exploiting desperate and um, Dylan Roof type characters, really. Virgins. That's who he speaks to. He right. is. He does. He does. He, that is who he identifies, organizes, brings, you know, gives them a community and then a digital community especially, and that's where they become radicalized, you know, on these sites. Just, just watch that Vice video and think to yourself, I wonder when the last time that guy had sex. Right. It's someone who's so Never. socially isolated and right. so um, secluded from any type of normal thought or just non-political thought in their right. life that, you know, it's an obsession for them and something that get, they find gives him purpose. Like, if you look at James Fields, who is the one who, you know, you can't dodge the dodge. He's that guy. Uh, drove that Challenger. He is the individual whose history teacher talked about how he had an obsession with, uh, you know, post-Weimar Republic Germany, Adolf Hitler, and then the formations of their, you know, the early formations of the Third Reich. And this is in high school. That isn't normal. Like, we try to, if you, I don't know if, if you were like me, but it was like, all right, I'll do the what's necessary to get an A in class, but by no means do I care that much about any subject matters right in high school in high school don't look offended she's, she's always offended i'm a literature minor so oh. so like yeah okay i, I loved the jungle like by upton sinclair and you know like there were certain the ugly american was great i didn't know that it would be foreshadowing of trump but, <laughs> you know, it, it really was in every way that but like no like in social studies you learn the world history and the civics class the government you have to no one goes on a deep dive on the ss and you know their organizational structure and what <laughs> i you know have a friend who did i that. do yeah <laughs> no, no no i, I mean in high school, school. In high school. Yeah. that's what i call yeah. vacation in high school in high school yeah, yeah. no did yeah. you really no no i have a i have a friend who did right what's yeah, he do yeah. now 
Uh, he has recently got his JD. Okay, okay. So he normied. He, ish. Nor- yeah. Ish. He'll be really good at his <laughs> subject within the law, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, but, you know, th- th- that isn't normal behavior. I mean, even... Th- no, it's not. Right. For a guy in Ohio, a middle a Midwestern kid from a relatively what we would you would think on the surface is a normal family to get so obsessed with Adolf Hitler and the return to Aryan principles and the rightful leadership of the Aryan race of society. That's just crazy. And so that's who this guy Kessler speaks to and identifies and, right. and feeds the point. They drive to Charlottesville, Virginia to go protest with a bunch of people carrying swastikas, getting maced in the face by Antifa people, trying to provoke the or trying to protest the removal of Robert E. Lee, whose only legacy is surrender right. in America. Honestly, like what other I legacy mean, is yeah, there unless, than he's a unless you are a true scholar of history, right? Right. I mean, because there's a lot more to the Lee story, but like yes. fleeing his <laughs> home <laughs> and that is now the Arlington Cemetery. But yeah, in the grand in, in yeah, in, of course. In but I mean, of today's, winners write history. All he is right. is he was the guy who lost right on he's the a, wrong side, and I you know. Yeah. To paraphrase Trump, I only like people that win wars. Right. You know, and so that's that's the thing is that isn't you shouldn't go unite around it. Slavery isn't a lasting vestige of white culture. It, By any means it's not like that was quintessential to the white experience in the course of history. Like was slavery. They they they're rallying around the loss of white culture and like when, exactly. when the fear yeah. of not being the political dominant. When right. when we walked yes. through this with one of our alt right friends, he, it basically was all about culture, saving Western civilization and our culture. The and Crusades. Like, and like that's a great that's a great dog whistle phrase, but that like because you and I will sit here and we talk about on this podcast, like, do you want to save Western culture? Well, hell yeah, absolutely. I love Plato and. Kant yeah. and the the uh, the uh, Enlightenment. Uh, I'm a big fan of Kant. Individual, you know, the proliferation of individualism and like natural rights and sure. you know the idea right. that you aren't just the byproduct of the community. Liberalism. Who's, who's against yeah. that? Classical liberal. Yeah, exactly. It's sort of the, the I hate liberalism though, so I'm offended. You. That's would put what that, that is. I know. <laughs> but it's it's sort of the same thing. Triggered. As, you know, I had great. to do it though. Oh, it's like that button. Hate liberals. Consider yourself a you know classical liberal. It, it's sort of the same thing as like, well, aren't you against racism? Right. You right. know, because who's against who's for racism? No, 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 no. I gave that up a long time ago. Right. <laughs> you know, like last that, week. And, yeah, and that's <laughs> where these guys are. I mean, that's where these guys are. Right after he took his foot off the ga- gas <laughs> <and that> dodge. <laughs> Not yeah. true. I put it in reverse next, and then I was done. <laughs> uh, uh, but I mean, you look at their thinking, and it's it comes from it comes from people who weren't looking for why society flourished. They were looking for a justification for their pre-existing prejudices. That's, yep. And that's my opinion. That's all it is. And this gave them the out. Mm-hmm. This gave them the very out they were looking for. And now you've organized them and they feel empowered. And it's not done. Right. And the more threatened be white more. people become, the less dominant they become as a composition in society, the more you're going to see things like, well, we need um, to pass a law about English being spoken as the only language or making it the official language. Right. Yep. We're going to see a lot of white pre- cultural preservation laws become very popular. The tearing down of the statute... If you look at the poll by town hall, that town hall cited in Charlotte of Charlottesville residents right at, right after all of this on Monday, the the majority supported it staying. Hmm. Even after all of the stuff that happened, they still supported it, which isn't shocking because if you look at the history of slavery in the United States, indentured servitude in the 60, late 1600s was the preference right. because life expectancies were so low, you could <laughs> There was no such thing as earning your freedom. They died right. well before they were ever going to be given their freedom. Then, as life expectancy increases, Virginia starts passing, you know, they, or they see that buying slaves is the better way for exploitive labor. Because in England, they had cheap labor. They mm-hmm. had, you know, sort of, sort of actually like the, Ju- the Upton Sinclair huge disconnect of poverty, you know, that people sure. would work for pennies. In the United States, there was a lack of labor. So then they just started buying people. That became the business model. Yep. So then they pass laws that support it, which is preservation of a better way of life, a more a more calm economic and southern protectionism. Way of life. Exactly, it, it's just mercantilism on a smaller scale. Absolutely. And so to consider that part of white tradition is ridiculous. It was an economic, pre- an economically pragmatic decision that made slavery predominantly popular in the United States. Right. All right, so let's get into it. This spilled over into the libertarian movement. Uh, the I wondered why we all had to take the, the uh, 
the Hebrew pledge. Well, <laughs> I just want to know who you're for and who you're against. I think as as white males, we must wake up every day and begin our day with an apology. We're throwing out the Pledge of Allegiance. That's offensive. That's nationalistic. We don't like that. We're now uh, swearing allegiance to uh, I, I love I am a tyrannical everyone. oppressor is what I say in the mirror each morning 30 exactly times. Right. Uh, no, I, I, I tweeted out something that it, like, surprised, it surprised me like how much traction it got, but it just seemed to have... Uh, I, I didn't tweet it out. I think I might have, but I, I posted it on Facebook. And I wrote, uh, hey, it's me. Just wanted to make sure you all know that I'm against racism and anti and against anti-Semitism. I am totally not cool with Nazis or the KKK. I know that <laughs> used to be so brave. That used to be just a given, but it looks like everyone is now required to check in with friends on social media and state the obvious. Please be sure to tell your friends you aren't racist today, or else. Uh, so. The and it kind of uh, was inspired by uh, a kerfuffle, if you will, that is happening in the libertarian movement. And I will say we're going to talk about Nick Sarwark, the chair of the National LP, a friend of the program, a friend of me, and a, f- a good friend of Brett Bittner. Um, we're going to talk about uh, he 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 got into a fight online uh, with Tom Woods, who is by any measure the largest libertarian podcast and media outlet, and. Uh, in my mind, not a good person to pick a fight with because he didn't really have any uh, ability to fight back, and it's been probably, uh, I know it's been uncomfortable for uh, Nick. Uh, We talked today. He's going to come on the program. We sent a message to Tom Woods. He was on in 2013, but uh, obviously he's much bigger. We were episode 16 of the Tom Woods show when that interview that we did with him, but uh, things have changed for Tom since then. Uh, Thanks uh, us too, but not quite as much. (laughs) Um, So I actually am running an ad on Facebook for Facebook likes, and it says, like the page of the the number one libertarian podcast in parentheses after Tom Woods. Uh, And it's done pretty well. So it's like that Avis, we try harder ad. (laughs) So so famous. Right. So what you have to understand about the Mises Institute, it was uh, Ludwig Ludwig von Mises. Uh, was part of the Austrian school and probably one of its brightest stars. And then uh, one of his students, Murray Rothbard, went on to carry on the tradition. They all came out of uh, the the Austrian school of economics, started by Karl Menger. And it it is probably the most uh, popular, most uh, connected to economic philosophy to the libertarian uh, philosophy because of Murray Rothbard's work. The logical assumption, you know, being that you know, you, everything starts with man's activity right, you know, on a right. micro level rather than, you know, a 10,000-foot approach. Yeah, the, the I think it's called The Betrayal of the Right by Murray Rothbard. Mm-hmm. is kind of his journey through all these different... He was one of, he was on the original National Review team. He was... Friends uh, with Frank uh, Meyer and yeah. sort of that blend of the National Review until it kind of... He uh, then off. decided to join the, uh, the radical left for a time, and then that didn't work, and then he joined the Libertarian Party, and that didn't work. And the thing about Murray Rothbard is he was kind of a dick. <laughs> And uh, he was a libertarian. He was a libertarian. <laughs> Probably an INTJ. Absolutely. Yes. 100% an INTJ. Let's be honest. If you've ever met David Friedman, just think <laughs> about you know a more bald, smarter version. Can you imagine how much poon Murray Rothbard slayed? Honestly. Oh, God. Uh, and so Rothbard uh, <laughs> literally wrote like books like The Anatomy of the State and The Libertarian Manifesto and all these great books that a lot of libertarian since Ron Paul, because Ron Paul was a new awakening for the libertarian yep. movement and is very closely associated to the Mises He's Institute. He's a Rothbardian. He's a Rothbardian. It has given that institute a new life. And there has been a lot of tension over the last 10 years, but really forever, because Rothbard like was hated the Cato Institute. He was part of the Cato Institute. And then the Craniacs, as he called them, kicked them out, Ed Crane and the Koch brothers. He's got a long track record of being welcomed, huh? Uh, yeah, he's been unwelcomed everywhere he's gone, but his his writings and his uh, reputation have been well guarded by the Mises Institute and most popularly by Tom Woods. And uh, I promised and vowed never to read a Rothbard book just because it's popular, and I have <laughs> taken that pledge back, and uh, and I have uh, I have started the betrayal of the right. I did uh, over the summer, and I really started to enjoy it. It was it was actually put together by Tom Woods, um, and 
I listen to the Tom Woods show every day. I didn't listen to the Tom Woods show for the longest time because um, I, I, he's associated with the Mises Institute and he's associated with Murray Rothbard. And in general, I have found that I don't like most people who are associated with the Mises Institute. I find them to be very much uh, like Lou Rockwell, I think, is a dick. I think he's just a very negative person, and uh, I don't like his podcast. I don't think that he is uh, a net positive for libertarianism in in the way that he presents on the media. Maybe in his behind the scenes work, I don't know, but uh, in terms of his podcast, like I never would refer anybody to go to LouRockwell dot com as as their first website. Honestly, I feel like he at this point he's just a historian for what happened back then. Right, and that's the maximum amount of use he had for like what it was like in the early days of libertarian, and, you know, where it is today. Right. I, I mean, I, I, I mean, that's sort of the way I feel. And so, because they are all so closely associated with Ron Paul, and Ron Paul was a Republican, many of them just didn't want anything to do with the Libertarian Party because they had been there, done that, and people like Walter Block, like uh, Murray Roth, like Lou Rockwell, like Ron Paul, just kind of were like they're irrelevant. We're not even going to worry about them. Uh, and I think that's kind of why you don't ever hear, if you listen to the Tom Woods show, they don't talk about the LP that much, um, unless it's kind of negative. Unless it's negative. Unless it's negative. And <laughs> well, he says, because he's talking to his market. Absolutely. And so there's been a tense ceasefire between the, the Ron Paul Misesians and the Libertarian Party people, of which you and I, Brett, Brett are, and Matt, I would say, are definitely part of that crowd. Uh, and then the the more right leaning libertarians of the the, the Cretans of uh, the world, the Cretans of the world. It's really That's y'all versus SFL on a different level. Type, type kind of, thing. of yeah. well, I mean that yeah. that is legitimately they're both descendants of the same fight. Right. Yeah, right. both those organizations. And, and are. so yeah, exactly. It's it's the Ed Crane <clears throat> Koch brothers versus the Mises Rockwell uh, and Rockwell. so League of the South, if you will. Have. Have I left anything out? Because you are more familiar with any of this stuff. No, that's, no that's, you that's did fantastic. It, yeah, right. the only thing you didn't talk about was the convention of 83 and the walkout when Berglund got the nomination. That's right. about it. Yeah. And that was by which swing? Rothbard. Uh, Rothbard. No, no, no. no, 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 no. The, the, the Cokes, Cokes walked out. Cokes, they the Cokes walked, walked out. out. They walked out. What was their main contention? Uh, that Berglund was too radical. Too extreme? Yep. Well, it started, it started with the, the Clark campaign in 80. Right, right. Which of not being radical enough. Was it Charles who was the VP? David, candidate? David was the David VP was candidate. the VP candidate, and, and until and last year, they the, the, they were the most successful LP campaign. Correct, correct. In terms of vote totals, right. So per capita, but they also spent way yes. more money than any other libertarian candidate. Because Coke could candidate. had no campaign limits right. because, because he, he was, was the, the candidate, candidate. Uh, right? Which is so. why he was the VP when you had Clark who had done so well. In seventy eight, I right. think running, running for, for governor of California, got like eight percent or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it was it was unreal. We'd never seen a, a candidate like that, so it was natural that he in eighty, after you had the the Hospers in seventy two, which was a sacrificial first, lamb for ticket. welcome to the you know welcome yeah, to the show. Yeah. Exactly, they were on the ballot in like eight states. Yeah, but they did get a an electoral vote from David McBride in Virginia. Uh, who was the 76 nominee? No, not Charlottesville. Who then became the 76 nominee? Who then became right. the 76 nominee as the faithless elector? And I thought it was actually Minnesota, not uh, Virginia. Oh, really? I, thought it was, I think it, I thought it was Virginia as well, but either way, it was somebody who was protesting Nixon. He was right. anti Nixon. He was very anti Nixon. He became the 76 nominee. So this is the first real serious political effort by the LP was in '80 with Clark and Koch because you saw that they had money. They had a message that they were trying to send. They a were sympathetic electo- electorate too. That, right. You know that was, that was the year of John rejecting, Anderson. They were rejecting also, liber- um, liberal. Like, they were rejecting. Keynesianism they were rejecting of, all of it because you had Anderson who was in the debates in '80. Yep. You had uh, Clark who did so well comparatively. Uh, to prior. Reagan taking the the you know mantle, supposed mantle of Goldwater, right? right. Um, and, and then in eighty, you had Carter running for re-election, which let's face it, was never going to happen. So you had an opportunity for people to look in the same way they did in 2016 for other avenues for their vote. Literally anything else. <laughs> Literally anything else. And you saw that with Anderson. With uh, I mean, Anderson got 9%, I believe, right. of the As an independent, vote. which is, uh, again... Did he run on a liber- as a libertarian no, or an independent? He was true independent. True independent. See, he, that works. He was, in the, uh, he was in the Republican primaries. And, and, and a lot of the sore loser laws that we saw come about were because, were because of the of 80 campaign when he ran as a Republican.
and then ran again as an independent once he was and no longer. He had, you know, some very early traction to potentially get the nomination over right. Reagan. Uh, but, you know, ultimately Reagan pulled through. And, and then Anderson, I think, bolted in like April. I mean, it was pretty late, right? Yeah. Because back then the, the cycle was nowhere near as long. Um, and then or nearly was, in the public de- uh, arena as nearly as right, much, right. I'm sure. Well, and then so he, he, uh, he was invited to the debates, and Carter refused to show up for, the, was it the first debate, I the believe, or the debate, second? It, yeah. It was the first one, and then he and saw And then he lost so much ground. Populism he in lost, the, uh, the, of the populist vote that he lost to Anderson by not being there as the sitting president. But anyway, back to, yeah, so... So, so then that Clark, feeds into 83... But but and Rothbard was pissed out. in eighty. Right. Okay. So yes, so because Rothbard it was pissed pure, in eighty because right. he was looking, he was seeking for what we hear here still today in the Libertarian Party, right? He wanted a purist, radical, unapologetically quote unquote libertarian. Really, what that means in in Rothbard's terms is right. is anarcho capitalist mm-hmm. uh, campaign. And Clark and privatize the courts, everything, right? Yeah. And so Clark and Coke were like, no, you know, they they ran on they a, ran on let's the let's reduce sell. taxes by thirty percent, right? Not right, eliminate right. them entirely, rather right? than and, cause and, a great depression with <laughs> radical austerity. But that's yeah. not like, and the, the the LP is still not past that, where it's it the pure, past it. purity versus. You know, let's let's run a Gary Johnson, a Bill Weld, even a Bill Weld, yes. versus you know somebody who is in the libertarian camp in terms of the political spectrum, or run, you know, some the most libertarian the, person you can run, the most Correct. quote unquote. Beca- and, and the problem with a Daryl lot- Perry. Uh, exactly that's exactly right. right. Yes, it, it's the 2016 comparison would be yes, it's choosing Gary Johnson or Daryl Perry. Um, except in 83, it was, well, in 80, it was Clark, and I don't even remember. I don't know who, who came yeah. up against. I mean, there, what I oh, understood Maru. is there was a little bit of, no, no he's Maru much later, a, you know, somewhat of a tacit agreement, like, let's, because, you know, Rothbard was part of the Cato Institute. He was right, right there with the Kochs yeah, this, at the time. It, and it, it came from the, the Dallas Accord, which is the... It came from the Dallas Accord, which is where libertarians, the the anarchist wing of the Libertarian Party and the more pragmatics, uh, or the minarchists, kind of came together and they said, look, basically we want to right the ship before we fight about where we end up. So let's focus on that. And, right. And the Dallas Accord then... Is that 74 or 77? I want to say it's 74. Karen and Harless would probably yeah. kill me for not knowing exactly when it happened, because that's... A but it was, it was very early in the history. It was super early in the party. And I, I mean, this is back when the platform for the LP had like what we would do when we colonize the moon. Correct. I mean, the the, the platform was just uh, interstellar. Uh, interstellar. I mean, it was it was just anybody because it was free and it, it's just the, the LP is um, very much made up by the people who show up. Yes. And so when I any political party or ragtag movement is, it's yes you're, no. you're a wild. Crazies that you can get to stay in line for a little bit to give the present, you know, including, the appearance of presentability. All, right. If, if, right. If, if you, Honestly, if you show up and work hard in the LP, you can run it in five years. If you show sometimes up, you don't even have to put in five years. <laughs> right. Exactly. Like it, it, it is. It is literally who shows up. And so when I see these people who write, "For this is why the Libertarian Party," blah blah blah, I go, "Just shut the fuck up and go get involved," because you're just. You're full of shit. You're lazy. You don't want to get involved. You were looking for an out in the first you're a, place. You're a keyboard warrior. Uh, exactly. First of all, right. you were and looking. Then you were looking for a reason to not be in a the part. land of keyboard warriors. You are king. Right. <laughs> no, you're not. You're a pathetic. Second loser. only to the Libertarian Party <laughs> yeah, itself. Second <laughs> only to the cast. You make your... us look like you know canvassers. Right. So, so yeah. The there has so been... the big schism. Yeah. There's yes. Been, there's been a tense ceasefire for a long time, and the the Ron Paul campaigns really put a lot of tension, especially with new libertarians as they came in, and people like Creighton, as you heard early on in the early days of this podcast in 2012, and you heard a lot in those 2012 episodes. What would I mean? There's an episode I think we called "Why Gary Johnson Should Run," and uh, in, in may, maybe that was about Rand Paul versus Gary Johnson. But if you go in the 2012 episodes about Ron versus Gary Johnson, you'll hear some of these arguments that we have. Uh, and you hear a Creighton versus a Galt and Spangle, who are LP people versus a Misesian in Creighton. You hear that tension. You hear that argument that goes on. And there, It'll never go away. It, it will never... Well, it'll never go away, but I think there's a large majority of people who are 
right-leaning libertarians, and in that, I would classify Greg and I certainly. Absolutely, I'm a I'm a constitutional conservative. Like I want to conserve the Constitution of the United States. I believe as originally written, except for that three fifths part. Exactly right, because the the Constitution as it is written on paper is very libertarian. Yeah, but I'm not an anarcho capitalist. I'm not going to go down. I've had. I'm not opposed to it in time if we can get this to catch on and grow and be adopted. But for right now, if right. I go out and run a campaign on private courts and you know radical libertarian ideals, you're going to be laughed out of the room. I was, I was, yeah, I'll, I will be detrimental to the entire movement because I'll be James Weeks just philosophically. When I I was just on a podcast last week, and I wish I could remember Seth Seth Hurd's podcast, um, but he was basically like. He had me on because he knew I was a libertarian. He heard me on the Bad Christian Network on on uh, Break It Down, and he was like, "I want somebody to explain libertarianism to me because it sounds interesting." But my libertarian friend just keeps talking to me about private police, and that just seems crazy to me. And so we had a conversation a lot about foreign policy because he's like, "I think that World War II was good, and I don't want private police." And so a lot of my problem with <laughs> the, the that's, Seth, I love it. That's the well done. Institute yeah. is that they start with like the most hardcore shit, and it just scares you. People. Mean the brutal things? Uh, uh, well, they are they are an, unapologetic anarcho capitalists, right? And when you go back and you take a look at the history of the libertarian brutalism piece that you read by Tucker, or parts of it that you read by Tucker earlier, mm -hmm. that was shortly after he, he departed the Mises, Mises Institute. Right. And he became... <laughs> free. Right. He became free of them. Right. right. He was he's doing, with Fee and Larry Reed now, he right? Is, he, yeah, he's, he's with Fee. He's the chief technology officer. He does Liberty.me. He does laissez-faire books. I mean, he... Is Liberty.me still functioning? As yeah, far as I know, absolutely. yeah. They, I know that I get updates about them on SoundCloud every once in a while. The Liberty, like Jeffrey Tucker, we've had on a couple times. If you go back in our feed and listen to Jeffrey Tucker, I love Jeffrey Tucker. Jeff, I think yep, he's awesome. I think he's uh, somebody that really, like, when I hear him talk about libertarianism, I want everybody to talk about libertarianism in the way that he does. The way because that Tucker he, does. He talks about it in a very humanitarian way. He talks about the beauty of what happens when people come together voluntarily to accomplish the goals that they want to, rather than turning to the state to use force to do it. Right. He's also the guy. That put all the free ebooks on the Mises website. Yep. He's now doing he that archived. for fee. Yep, he you archived know. the entire Mises library. He did that for Laissez Faire, where he was uh, focused on. I mean, he did. Um, there was a period of time where you could donate to Laissez Faire. I think it was ten dollars a month, and you got a ton of ebooks. And I still have probably a thousand that I downloaded that I haven't read. Wow! Because of the time that I was a donor. Let's be clear, libertarian. You know, philo philosophy is not, you know, it's not known for its brevity. It is you, not. You, you get a tomb. And it's all it's wall extreme. Of text. Oh, it's perfect, though. I mean, it's, it's, it's logically, you know, consistent all the way through. It's wonderful. It is just and, a lot to get and, the full nuance of everything you need to grasp to understand why. And I think that's important because that's the tradition of Mises himself. That's the tradition of Rothbard, right? Sure. He is known for being... It incredibly brilliant and a, 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 yeah. a perfect intellectual that and brings a, a great reason case together as to why you know we land at anarcho capitalism right and and that that again helps fuel the split that happened and then the adoration that mm -hmm. people like Tom Woods and those associated to LVMI still still have what, today really the academic community and the intelligentsia within the movement. Other than Horowitz, maybe. Yeah, Horowitz yeah. is the rare uh, PhD that's among the left libertarians. And then the guys at Bleeding Heart Libertarianism. Right. Correct. Uh, Although Matt. They're, and they're growing, it's just they're what's younger. Matt's, what's Matt's Zawalicki? name? Zawalicki? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Zawalinski. Uh, Zawalinski. And there's, San Diego there's a State, few more there, too. Um, and then, you they're know, just not as prominent The, the Nickerson Center, uh, the new, that, which is relatively new, mm -hmm. also yep. has you know some some... Left-ish uh, leaning. They're still flushing out their philosophy. -like when you say things, left yeah. libertarianism versus right libertarianism, what do you mean? Social justice libertarianism. I, I, see, I don't see it that way. Because, partially yes, partially no. I mean, I, the way that I look at it is, is it's what you focus on and how you talk about it. Mm -hmm. and, and social justice part is just the more appeal for those individuals. Well, and because for me, when I'm talking about libertarianism, it's I, I have a very difficult time selling the things that I think everybody should automatically know. Yeah, that's because though, Economics, you've ascended the cave and know it all, like, uh, and see how they're connected. But but I mean, but no, seriously, like that you see it from you see where they are and why they're there. Right. 
And, and so I, I get the economics of it. And I think everybody else should because it was apparent to me. I didn't have to have anybody explain it to me. I didn't have to go to, I didn't have to go to LVMI's stuff. I didn't have to go to the fee seminars. I, I already got that. Like it wasn't something that I needed to focus on. And, and I have found that when it comes to actually talking to people about the issues that are important to them, they don't care. No. about the economics of things. They care about the situations that affect them. The economics becomes a means to the end to get to wherever it is. And if that means government intervention or right. state-sponsored this, that, or the other, then they're fine. And so right. I, can, I feel that I can do a better job explaining the ideas of liberty by talking about the issues that for many are viewed as leftist issues or left libertarian issues. But for me, they're just civil libertarian issues. Yeah, cr crime and corruption. It, it's, it's the crime, corruption. It's, you know, elevating a, a class of people over another, elevating collective groups over another, it, rather than us focusing on things as individuals and judging what should happen based on how individuals would react. Yeah. And which gets back to a lot of the Mises stuff and a lot of the Rothbard stuff. I mean, you take a look at the basis of LVMI is Mises and human action and those kind of things. And it eventually gets back around to it, but there are so many they people... They never get there. That, because they're so right. focused on trying to cram Austrian economics down your throat, they don't actually have a real conversation with someone. They're just so focused on winning that <laughs> argument that they're having with you by pushing it down until you relent. So, so it is, and, and in addition to that, right, it's so that that argument latched on to what is now referred to as the old right, mm -hmm. right? Taft Republicans of, yep. the, of the 40s, yep. right? As, as How Godfrey their, described as himself their originally. their best chance of, of being relevant, right? right? And so their tradition and their ethos and everything, to me, seems wrapped up into, like, my ver you know my version of the libertarian movement is it is part of the right it is part of that uh that movement okay. the paleo libertarians and so, really. exactly and so you know when i refer to left libertarians in in the general sense and even would describe myself that way in in many cases it's not necessarily coming from the left per se as we think of the left today it's just i'm not coming from the right yeah <laughs> exactly and, I, and right? honestly i think a lot of it is what's the best way to deconstruct the state if you're talking about Honestly, if you think you're going to end the Federal Reserve, you sound like a person at a protest or on a street corner at during Gen Con talking about everybody's going to hell and yeah, you know you'll get people on right the left the to say the same thing too. So right, you I mean, will, you will. But, it, but if you you can reach people, the guy shouting out of a megaphone about how you're going to hell is less effective than the person. I feel your pain, but but you they know, have, where does it hurt? But right. the people that are shouting through the megaphone have a different aim. They're not trying to recruit people. They want true believers, exactly, which is the right libertarians. Exactly. They're all true believers. Yes. Because they've seen the light. They understand it. It makes sense. The model all fits together. And that's why they just, they can't, they can't not preach basically old fundamentalist Baptist libertarianism. Like mm -hmm. you have to do it this way. This it's is why it worked way. for me. Yep. This is the only thing that's you know been proven to work. And so much of that comes from how people came to find libertarianism. And so much of the outreach and so much of the recruitment came from the right. Mm -hmm. And in... What you talked with Nick about in in the back and forth was you were talking about how you felt it was easier to recruit from the right. I, I, I totally think it is. But a lot of that is because that is the path that you came to find. I don't, because I you don't came agree. from the right. You came from the right. You didn't necessarily come from the right. And I didn't come from the right or the left. I was just... The immaculate libertarian. Basically, I mean, I'm like we, Bane. We I was both, born we into We were both it. weirdos um, for a long time. I, yeah. I think that it, it... Like, Greg will back me up on that. I hate economics. Like, oh, yeah. I, I could care less about economics. No, I care about... But the, I don't mean the, it that way. I mean, you came to libertarianism from, from the rebel. Yeah, your point of origin. But I, I, uh, the reason that I, I don't agree with Nick, in my opinion, Nick is trying to purge the libertarian party of... The, Change the composition to be more appealing to social justice libertarians. It, exactly, and trying to push the old guard Misesians out. And from in some perspective, I understand that, but they also all weren't really with him in the first place. Uh, I, I just don't see that pursuing... I think we saw a, it was a, cat a catastrophe when Gary Johnson tried to go after the left in 2016. Like, there's nothing about him that appealed to 
leftists. A lot that, did. It's just not enough to pull the lever. Uh, exactly right. Which is why leftists are A lot are of that collectivists. happened on the right, though, too, guys. I mean, he right. ended up pulling more from the left than he did from the right. Right. If he had just gone out there and sounded like a Taft Republican, though, he would have got a lot of votes. Exactly. And it goes right. back I don't think to... He would. I don't... And I run do as an independent. Not, I do not think so. Well, yes, as an independent, sure, but the, the ballot access laws are crazy in that right. regard. So... I, I don't – I mean, we can – that's a whole other episode. Oh, debate, yeah. The 2016 election and, and all that. But, you know, I I think strategically, ultimately, there are a lot of failures. I don't think it was because he was trying to be too far to the left or, you know, and, and not sympathetic oh, enough oh, to the right. Because th- Trump Trump filled the the, the low-hanging fruit vacuum uh, in He stole the libertarian ways. support for Ron Paul in every state. Well, here's here's the thing about as an outsider, Gary Johnson. In my opinion, he was trying to be too many things to too many people. Yes, yeah, I agree and, with that. And that's he was that like government time. trying to do too much, right? He, and the by and large, when you look at if you look at large scale demographics, and we're going to just generalize people mm-hmm. people who are on the left are more inclined to collectivist arguments than individual arguments. There is a higher burden that we have to prove to those people uh, a- a- about an individualistic world. There is much more, uh, it-, it-, it takes more time for us to sell to those people in in just salesmen. Consumers so, are more demanding. Yeah, shortly, I, right. I think it depends on what you're selling. But, and it depends on where you, know, you are. It de- I mean, there's so much that but that, let me. I want to. I want to reel the, the, this in a different direction. The though. other thing, and let me finish this point, is that the the leftist groups, if, if the Democrats are a coalition party, they Absolutely. are they are made up of Hispanic caucuses and Black caucuses and and various different types of of collectivist groups that join together and fight for the common Democratic cause. And then when they win, they, they divvy stick. up the spoils. They divvy up the spoils. And, and you see that with, with groups like the HRC coming out and talking about issues that aren't specific to the LGBT community, mm-hmm. where they're talking about saving Obamacare. And they're, I mean, trust me, I'm on the mailing list for them and for Lambda Legal and, and some of those groups that seem to have a very niche focus, but now that they've won with Obergefell being decided by the Supreme Court, they still have to remain relevant. And right. they realize that the way to do that is to continue with their, again, their audience. And this was my argument with my alt-right friend, is he was arguing that it's easier to to argue libertarianism to white people because they understand individualism better than minorities do. No, white people are culturally more individualistic than any other ethnicity and I said, in America. But, uh, let me finish my point, guys. Everybody stop cutting me off. Uh, you... You have in these minority cultures, they have had to band together and collect because of white supremacy in the history of this country. And there is a strong reaction on the left and and in uh, liberal groups towards collectivism that is just a it's a harder sell from a. Well, on a one-on-one basis, like if Matt is talking to a Democrat one-on-one, absolutely, you can you can get past that. But on a broad messaging spectrum, we have seen in the last ten years that I have been in the libertarian movement, one successful politician in Ron Paul who went after the right and was able to market those broad themes and pull in a lot of people, even though he was a wildly ineffective communicator, and Gary Johnson who was as wildly ineffective as a communicator, but had a better resume and less of a cranky attitude. And he he tried to ride the fence, and he wasn't as effective as Ron Paul was. And so when, when I say uh, we should spend our time on the right, I personally think that the Libertarian Party or the Libertarian movement as a whole is center-right because it's more towards individual liberty and individualism, and so it's just an easier sell from a broad messaging perspective. And so when when Nick Sarwark wants to go after, and, and essentially Jeff Deist, who is the the head of the Mises Institute, uh, he gave a speech. Uh, I cut you off. Finish no, your point. I, I mean, what I was going to bring it back to, and it, it relates to this because it, it leads up, and, and you talked about how the movement grew so much mm-hmm. around the Ron Paul campaign. Um, you know, the cult, and I know you have opinions around this, so I was going to let you spout. <laughs> the cult of personality around Ron Paul right. continues to plague the libertarian movement today. Absolutely. I love Ron Paul as much as the next guy, maybe right. not quite as much as the next guy. Um, but, you know, it, it continues to perpetuate way beyond its shelf life. Uh, 
Yep. And and you know Tom Woods, who we'll we'll get to through this what next point you're about to bring up, right? Is is uh you know. Uh, person number one in terms of perpetuation of the Ron Colt personality. Well, right. Austin Peterson on another level is too in yeah. the primary. Yeah. The the thing about the Mises Institute is they've done a better job of putting out their people in a front role and and promoting them than like the Cato Institute or you know reason everybody knows Nick Gillespie and Matt Welch. Like they've done a great job. The of guy in the leather person. jacket on Bill Maher. Right. Yep. The you know but the Mises Institute has done a great job of promoting those cults of personalities and promoting the Walter blocks of the world, uh, you know, and, and so, and they get more traction because of that. And Jeff Deist is their new president. Or the head or of the whatever, institute. CEO he's, or whatever. He's the yeah, head he, of it. Yeah. And he, he, and he gave a speech, which I'll read here. Because was that the one in Europe? I don't. A, well, the, the podcast that uh, triggered this and uh, was, he, it was a speech in Malta. Yeah, that was the one. Yeah. 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 And so he said, and honestly, he says something along the lines of a lot of what we've talked about on this podcast. Um, we might fight for property, too. Maybe not as fiercely. We certainly would protect our homes, but that's because of the people inside. How about cars? Would you physically tangle with an armed robber who is driving away in your car? Or would you just let him go and not risk death or injury just to save your car? How about your wallet? How about something someone stealing 40% of your income, as many governments do? Would you take up arms to prevent this? We probably wouldn't fight for Bitcoin or net neutrality or a capital gains tax, by the way. Uh, how about an abstraction like fighting for, quote unquote, your country or freedom or your religion? This is where things get more tenuous. Many, thing, many people will fight for such abstractions, but if you ask soldiers, they'll tell you that in the heat of the battle, they're really fighting for their mates to protect the men in their units and to fulfill a personal sense of duty. In other words, blood and soil and God and nation still matter to people. Libertarians ignore this at the risk of irrelevance. And he used a phrase in blood and soil that was a, which I had never heard this phrase. I don't know about you guys. I had, yeah. Yeah, and it was a Nazi phrase that was about pure blood and making sure that we have, Le I mean, t the idea that like the Nazis fought for leg room, Levenschwau, is is ridiculous to me, but he it goes back to their creation myth. You you can look at this in two ways. You can look at this as somebody who is using an artful phrase to echo back to history to invoke those things, saying this is what they're invoking, and we have to be careful that people f are are drawn to fascism, and we need to be aware of this. Or you can say. We are using a dog whistle phrase to attract Nazis to the Mises Institute. Nick Sarwark is the chairman of the National Libertarian Party. In my opinion, he's been a very good chairman. Um, but Nick is very snarky. And Nick's snarkiness doesn't really work as chairman of the National Party, in my opinion. And I think that it sometimes gets him into trouble. And he uh, was... He... Deist went on Jeff Tom Woods' podcast recently to talk about this, and they both... <laughs> the Nazi accusation. The, the, the <laughs> accusation that he's a Nazi, and they both claimed that it was absurd. I did not listen to it. I did not hear the actual podcast. I don't, I don't think Deist actually was back on, because uh, I tried to listen they to just both played of his those speech. today. They, right. He played the entire okay. speech in early August, like gotcha. about August 2nd or 3rd, and then today, or the most recent podcast yesterday, it was with Gottfried. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And and they, there were references to it in, in that podcast. Right. I yeah. did listen to that. But uh, Nick chose to ascribe the meaning that this is dog whistle politics and that the Ludwig von Mises Institute is the official think tank for the alt-right. And He criticized. What he said is that he listen, He goes and reads um, Murray Rothbard's right-wing populist essay on Lou Rockwell's page. And right. what it was was the OG strategy for creating a political movement between libertarians and right-wing populists with the or with the, the Pat Buchanan campaign in '92. Right, right. And Nick considers it a failure. He considers that a political failure because the association's politically toxic and turns away anyone you might be appealing to because of the type of uh, phrases you use, the references to nationalism, traditionalism, white, you know, 
and, and it, white favoritism at minimum, and it yeah. centers the the libertarian movement and philosophy directly in that uh, incredibly conservative. We'll use that in a very friendly, culturally way. preservationist uh, uh, sense, right? So yeah. it does not it. It's not that it's not quote unquote catering to the left, <laughs> right? It's shutting the fucking door. Yep. To, to the, the op- yeah, it closes the door to the potential of reaching out to the disenfranchised Bernie of, you know, they get mad and they say that, you know, government, they get mad because they say government's corrupt. They never take the time to realize it's the very institution and the re- the, what it allows that is, encourages corruption, not the people in it. If they understood that, you know, there weren't these angels they'd ever find that could go and run a government great, you know, the answer to, to, to corruption is not more government. Right. It'll just lead to more corruption. And so they, you know, the appeal of someone when the light finally clicks on, oh, crap, you know, it wasn't so much that Hitler did the Holocaust and he was a bad guy. It was that their government's monopoly on force allowed him to do so and allowed someone who's a terrible person to take control of that monopoly. You know, once the light comes on that government allows the corruption and the genocide, then you have no appeal for you're not appealing to those people because you're going around using the same themes to appeal to the neo Nazis. Right. Yes. So it's drawing a clear line in the sand. For the most part. Yeah. And I mean, what's your opinion on this, Brett? Well, so I think that Matt laid it out. You literally closed the door on recruiting from one side of the political spectrum. Mm hmm. And when you completely shut that down, it's going to take decades to open that door back. Sure. You're going to have a hard time finding the key. You're going to have an even harder time opening that door. And by the time you finally do, you've lost so much political capital by only, folk, by only being able to talk to maybe 40% of the American electorate that you're never going to be able to to be where you want to be. Right. And, and I think Woods, the Von Mises Institute, Ron Paul, all are, have been willing to take that risk, not necessarily like, oh, let's associate ourselves with right. this, this horrible ideology of, of racism. However, Mises, w- whatever, whatever might have been there, newsletters, yada, yada, let's put that aside for, the set, for a moment. Yep. I, I think that, that that group is ready to disavow any chance of attracting the left in, mm-hmm. in, in today's world, in today's political world, and thus the strategy, and, and you know, Ron Paul's a Republican, Rand Paul's a Republican, right, has been, this is, this is where we place the bets. Damn the torpedoes. We don't care about anything that comes, you know, outside of that. We are going to, re, you know, we are going to brand libertarianism in, in a sense of conservatism, mm-hmm. right? right? And, and so I personally don't agree with that. I think we have counterfactuals in my own personal experience that Ron Paul brought people in from the left to just that, that blows that theory out of the Absolutely. water, sure. right? And so I think, I think that, that, and that's why I've stopped reading Mises, you know, I don't know, eight, nine years ago, right? And it just wasn't, I, I found nothing that came out of the Mises blog or, you know. They stay in very crew. clear boundaries on what they yeah. research and, and, and contribute so, to. You know. Well, they, th- in my opinion, they have, as an institute, pigeonholed themselves into fanboy territory. And if they stray too far, then they they run the risk of alienating the, the people that they have so hardcore indoctrinated in, in some ways. I, the I, Catholic I Church doesn't just come right out and say, we support gay marriage. You know I, what I, mean? I don't know if it doctrinated. Next- if indoctrinated is the right way. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you no, off. No, no, but I mean, it's the same thing. Like, you're not going to have the Catholic Church just come out and say, oh, we support gay marriage out of nowhere. You know, it's a slow boil if you can get them to evolve to that point. Right. You're really responding to the context. What I, what I like about Tom Woods is that Tom Woods is likable and that Tom Woods is a clear communicator and that he has a, the ability to talk on a wide breadth of subjects. He and is, did so for a very long time when there was no one else out there. And and is now a thousand episodes in, and people can go download and get a full education on the current events in, in, in a, a very deep way from a certain perspective. But he's also been willing to go and uh, interview people like Chris Cantwell and people that he... He's fearless. ...that he doesn't agree with. Um, but it is interesting that he did pull the episode with Chris Cantwell. It is right. no longer online. So, hold on. I, I, I mean, I do think, I mean, I haven't looked through his entire 1,000 history, uh, mm-hmm. episode history, but, I mean, how many, how often has he reached out to, say, members of the left, right, 
especially maybe the radical left, to attempt to find sympathies and attempt to find common ground. I doubt you would find that. Well, there's there's the Tucker Carlson way in which you're describing, which is go out and beat up liber- liberal professors. And there's people who will talk to people. Like, let's be honest. I, I Chris mean, Cantwell, talking to people. Talking, yeah. Here's the Cantwell thing with, with Tom Woods. Tom Woods talked to Chris Cantwell three or four years ago. Like, Chris Cantwell was a divisive person, but this was even pre-brutalism. Mm-hmm. Chris Cantwell was a well-known figure in the libertarian movement at the time. And to say that somehow he is interviewing Chris Cantwell as a dog whistle that he believes in white supremacy, based on what Chris Cantwell says now, time traveling back into time, like, and, and guilt by association just doesn't work here for me. Yeah. Like, I just don't find that to be a rel- Like, it is, Chris Cantwell is a despicable human being. And I wouldn't have interviewed him. We could have interviewed him. We didn't interview him, but we also aren't doing the same type of show that Tom's doing, where Tom is trying to reach out to people who have a, a, a position of status in the sure. libertarian movement and so talk to them. I, I have no issues with, with that particular case, right, and, and years ago, whatever. But th- there are some troubling aspects, right, and, and I know Brett will, will like to go go further on this, but I'll, I'll you know, his revisionist... Uh, history, especially around the Civil War, Mm -hmm. is disturbing. Quite. Um, And and he's not the only one, and so I don't know how much of it is him, how much of it is, you know, this is just kind of the whole Mises slash Southern connection, although Woods is a Northerner himself. Contrarians Uh, are going to contrarian. You know, (laughs) but... But you also, from from within Mises, you have Tom DiLorenzo, who spends an inordinate amount of time tearing down Lincoln, yeah, not saying right. that Lincoln was great, but he does. When you look at the at the general American populace, they would not appreciate... There's a lot of pushing of that the Civil War wasn't about slavery. Right. It, There's a lot of pushing. Yeah, which is just wrong. And it's just wrong. And it happened it on our Facebook wrong. page the other day. Like, the, the Civil War, it's like saying that, okay, okay, well, there were probably 10 reasons that the Civil War happened. And in and, and this pie... 80%, 90% of it was the fact that for for 400 years we'd had people in chains and were systematically murdering, raping, killing human beings and using them as property. Well, they invaded our border. Okay. All right. I mean, it, it's you can't say that, 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 that those nine in the 10% of the 90% is the dominant reason. That's just intellectually dishonest. Uh, but I do think that there is value to see the the alternative history. There is value to understand that there were actions by Lincoln taken that shredded the Constitution. He was a tyrannical pr- president, and and he did it to save the Union. When in reality, what was the point of saving the Union? If if the saving the Union was about uh, keeping the Union together then that to me is not a just war. If the un- if the civil war is about saving black people from slavery, I'm for that. You know, in our own country going to war to end that ill. I mean that it's the civil war is a pestilence that was uh, the consequence of sin in my opinion. I mean it, it was the, but Lincoln didn't go to war to save black people. Lincoln right. went to war to save the union. And a, it, a much less noble, a much less, much cause. more cowardly cause, and he did it in a way that usurped so many of the congressional powers yeah. to to save the country. So Lincoln is is a complex figure, and I he is revered and a hero in our 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 government schooling. Brett wouldn't know anything about this because he was homeschooled, but uh, he was homeschooled his own bus. at his own, own pace. pace, own pace, yeah, um, but. The complexity of a Washington, a Jefferson, a Lincoln, these are things that should be discussed. And I don't fault somebody like a DiLorenzo or a Tom Woods for putting that forth. It doesn't make them a racist to say certain things or to introduce certain ideas. Like, I know that Greg is not a racist, but Greg makes some memes that are pretty fucking racist, honestly, bro. <laughs> Which ones? <laughs> <laughs> like the one where you and I were driving a, a Challenger a into a crowd Challenger. of black people today? <laughs> yeah. No, it was white people's Gen Con. Yeah, it was Gen oh. Con. Oh, okay. Well, I'm it was a whole bunch of nerds. I'm for white genocide, honestly. Yeah, it was Danny Lundy. <laughs> yes. Oh, then I'm definitely for it. <laughs> um, See, if you don't know, Gen Con had for years not been paying, or they had been giving free tickets to people that were volunteers, right? And so that's how they compensated them rather than paying them an hourly wage. 
turns out to respect a law that's on the books and the they're founded in Washington D- or in Washington State. They are not allowed to this year except those volunteers because it's free, you know, free labor, and it, it, they don't count that as compensation for your access and all the stuff, the swag they get. And so, you know, I can't support an organization that exploits free labor. Right. I don't think it's right. I think they should be paid a fair and living wage, and yep. I'll never get on board with exploitative. You know, it's a lot like slavery. Yep. I can never support Gen Con slavery. It's it's the same thing as like entertaining the idea. Like on on this show. Greg is uh, Greg is not as hardcore of a Trump supporter as he makes himself out to be. No, I like Trump the character, not Trump the policy wonk. Uh, same here, and and but if you if you say, yeah he's done some good things, which he has, then you are you're pinned into one of these two groups, and so we've lost the ability to have nuanced. free flowing nuanced discussions. Right, you can't be both. You have to be one or the other. Well, and and we're seeing that in the debate that's coming out among non-libertarians about Charlotte's. But well, I won't say all non all libertarians hold what I'm gonna anyway. In the in the non-libertarian world, you are either pro alt right or you're, or you're pro Antifa. Right. It's the only thing you can be. You can right. be one or the other. And as Matt pointed out, there is no nuance. Right. It's libertarians that are saying, hey, look, it was the introduction of violence into a political situation that's really the problem. And it doesn't matter who's doing it, who's perpetuating it, who's starting it, who, you know, the whatabouts. It all comes down to the fact that there were a bunch of people, regardless of which side of the situation they were on, that used violence for political ends. Right. And social ends. And so, in doing so, they were wrong. And it doesn't matter if you're talking about the alt-right. It doesn't matter if you're talking about Antifa. It, all that matters is that you point to the fact that violence was what was wrong. And that's what many libertarians are pointing to, is the fact that, again, it's not I'm pro-alt-right or that I'm pro-Antifa. It's that I am anti-violence. But that gets lost in the way that we have and we see this in elections where you have, there's only the Republican, there's only the Democrat. Well, there's only the alt-right, and there's only Antifa. There were other people that were there, too. It's the tyranny of the binary, as we've called it. I think that's a great term yeah, for it. Yeah, the tyranny of the binary. What I think is missing from this entire debate is the actual history of it. Rothbard wasn't dumb. He's an incredibly smart guy, and Absolutely. his decision to affiliate with the, the current, the, a the, the origins. Expedient he had tried thought. the left. Right. What do people forget is Rothbard would have died to affiliate with the left. He catered his message to the left. He worked with the new left, the re- left wa- radicals, in a very free love hippie Woodstock era, who he was sure he could, you know, curate the right content and get them to walk down, you know, come on board. Didn't happen. Yeah. Once he saw that avenue is closed, and I maintain well, the same thing he found, you will never, I don't care about anecdotal or the one off, you know, the exception doesn't disprove the rule in my opinion. I think at the end of the day, you give Bernie Sanders and hand him up in this last election, you lose about 250,000 libertarian voters who claim to be libertarians. Because they would have felt... Joe Ruiz, one of our former co-hosts, mm-hmm. loved Bernie more than any Gary, Gary, than anyone. Left libertarians will always, always, always be susceptible to going back to the collective's and thinking, well, oh, that's who I used to be, and this one really, he speaks to me in a way that the, the, the old, you know, Hillary didn't. And so that is why I believe that the left is the biggest waste of time, because we've already been there, already done that. And so then you say, well, if the left's closed, shit, we might as well get as many of the people on the right or that out there to get. Right. It's a strategically smart decision. It was the most effective, I think, political decision the libertarian movement has made. I, don't, I hate those people. I, so I, I don't dis- care if I turn I, I disagree. I hear where you're coming from. Oh, yeah, and it's dis- a personal I, thing. I, I, yeah. and, and, and I'm not right. There is no right. I, I disagree Whoa, did as you well. Get that? Did you record that? Uh, well, he and I are very different, and he'll admit that he may be wrong. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm often wrong. I'm just never in doubt. Right. <laughs> I'm never wrong. <laughs> That's why he's a leader. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. So getting, going to, to what you were talking about, you take a look at the last 10 years of recruitment within the libertarian movement, and it has been... Primarily to the right, a lot of that has to do with Ron Paul, 
Um, and again, it also has to do with eight years of having President Obama in office yes. where you can be a part of the opposition and you become friendly with the opposition party. You become friendly with the opposition movement. It's much easier to pull from that side at that point in time. We are now in a different political era where we have milked, I believe, all of that outreach to the right for all that it's worth. And we are now in a position where we can be, again, part of the opposition movement, part of the opposition to the current Yeah, it's leadership. context specific on who you recruit to. So at this point, when you have a Republican in the White House, you have somebody who people, for some reason, identify as a, quote, conservative. It is a lot, it, it makes more political sense, in my opinion, to mm -hmm. focus your efforts in pointing out the negatives of their leadership and their policy and aligning yourself with the people that you can be friendly with on those terms and work on your recruitment in that way as you've already milked everything on the other side for the last eight years for all that it was worth. Yeah, I Agreed. mean, for me, it goes back to the challenge that, and, and this kind of touches, talks on to the kind of the, the series that we talked about at the earlier, what we were going to maybe do, right? right? Is that, I mean, libertarianism in of itself is a natural extension of what liberalism was for centuries. And, and it is an uncomfortable and uneasy home for it to sit within anything that is conservative. Mm -hmm. it, it ultimately does not fit there. And, and it has fit there better, arguably, than it has fit on the left for probably at least 60 years at this point. Absolutely. Right. Because everything um, switched. But because there's a lot of, well, yeah, we, and we can go, it's early 20th century, late 19th century stuff of the a complete transformation of what liberalism is. And that's why we now call, talk about classical liberalism versus, you know, but, but the bottom line is I, I, I just don't think that it can continue to be, you know, that, that it's a 60 year aberration to a degree, you know, more or less when you look at the overall, when historical. you look at the overall historical and, and so eventually it's going to come back. Right. And, and I think the other mistake, if you, you think the American left is going to become not necessarily of no, 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 not necessarily that, but that you're going to see that the last 60, 60 years will probably, it'll probably last for a, a longer, it, at least a hundred years. But, um, I think that you'll actually see that the terms that used to be will once again actually accurately represent what they are. So the party of Lincoln will go back to being the party of Lincoln and the party of Jefferson will go back to being the party of Jefferson? Possibly. I mean, liberalism but has we're also in, its, talking in its history, right? 40, 50 years from Individual now. liberty. I mean, that is, that is where liberalism was birthed, was out of the, you know, basically the revolutionary not, the divine right of, not the divine right of kings, right. power to the people. Right. And, and power to the people is populism. still a phrase that you hear the left talk about today because it is a natural evolution of what liberalism is. And, and libertarians Radical should change. be willing to embrace that. Right. Mm -hmm. The challenge is, is that collectivism. Right. You know, it c has come into play. And not, I, I don't want to actually use collectivism because that has different connotations around it. It's it's the welfare state. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and the fact that the state needed to step in to do something that. Uh, and, and frankly, the rise of democracy had a lot to do with this as well. And again, we'll save this for, for future episodes. But, you know, the the fact that, you know, Antifa and other hardcore left uh, ideologies or, or organizations that espouse those ideologies, like libertarianism has its birth in those ideologies, like the word libertarianism, right? The so, decentralization so of power. So things like anarcho-syndicalism... Mm -hmm which is, it's anarchy, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a close relative. The difference is, is that instead of a capitalist system from an economic perspective, it's a syndicalist perspective, right? And, and frankly, in an anarchist society, can I sit here and tell you that I think necessarily that capitalism would be better than syndicalism? Frankly, I, I can't make that call. And, and frankly, now we're just talking about theory and, and magic unicorns we're to a degree, right? <laughs> totally. Where's the fairy dust? But, yeah. but, to, but then to part. reject all of that, um, you know, uh, hard, you know, more radical philosophy on the left, I think, is, does not serve us good. Oh, great. Yeah, it's, they, are way, they are the home of revolutionary well. change and quick change, and they're also the home of decentralization of power in the name of populism. And so it's just that they're they arrived at the logical conclusion that we need to collectivize after we revolt. 
And so that's the only protection that remains. But do you against... collectivize via the state, or do you collectivize via? If the voluntary you can sell them on private collectivism, right? I mean, that's great. Know. I mean, I mean, I just, I just. Well, that's think what, what anarchy is. It is, and my my opinion is just that once you get into that mindset, there's a natural appeal to power, obviously, and so you're going well, to create is, institutions and this that is guarantee why I'm not it's, an anarchist. Right. Right. So I mean, it, there's there's challenges amongst all of it right? exactly yeah. it's just i don't think that once you become a collectivist and it's so rare for people to flush these things out intellectually and philosophically they never abandon the collective mindset and see no harm of creating a collective institution that prevents the fear of overthrow yeah. since they're the power to the people class yeah but i i don't think which is what the revolutionary generation did individualism i don't think personally can survive on its own I, I do not believe I you know that this is why again this is where, this is where the conservative movement became the potential home, right? In in the, the last Liberty hundred Caucus. years, it's because you go to the family union, uh -huh. right? It's not let, forget the state, but we still need community. We still need that connection. But, yeah, the right? social bonds. And, and so, where do those social bonds come from that we can rely on? The church. The family, Inst right, and and those institutions, non-state institutions, is where the anarcho-capitalist wing, mm -hmm. right, decided to latch itself to as the natural new ally. They needed an answer, right, and that was the answer they needed because that's where, like, and this is where the there was the schism between Rothbard and Ayn Rand. Yep, is because the the uh, objectivist theory of the absolute elevation of the individual. Rothbard's like, no. No, social Darwinism isn't necessarily a good thing, and Ayn Rand would disagree. Right. You know, well, that problem will handle itself. <laughs> so to bring this back to the Sarwark Woods thing and showing, I guess, my bias to begin with. Um, your bias is just hanging out of your. It is out of your well, microphone, and, and and that's fine. You know, I understand the motivation for Nick in pointing out the problem with focusing only on the right. Right. And then what really drove me crazy about the conversation that then took place was, yes, Nick is very snarky. Maybe it wasn't the best time to be talking about this. Maybe it wasn't the best Nazi arrow. associations are never. Well, wait, it wasn't the best right. arrow to shoot at Woods at this time. And maybe Woods was not the right. Or at and, all. Right. And, and, right. Or anyone at Mises. And, Lou and, Rockwell. Wait, okay. Hang, hang yeah, on. Hang five. on. Hang on. Hang on. So, but you, you get to the actual conversation that took place, and you saw that one of the people in the conversation, while snarky, was very full of class, and you had somebody else in the conversation that went directly to derogatory comments, went directly to insults, went directly to name-calling, two or three tweets into the conversation. I guess we can't really say anything about that, Greg, can we? What? The name-calling was... Oh, I prefer direct the... confrontation than to passive-aggressive indirect comments. I, like, mean, I, I think that's just pussy behavior. I mean, I kind of thought it was funny when he called to use, him a used car salesman. Like, Nick is a lawyer. And it's he's a fact. A, and, and, right. But well, and, yeah, but, the, the, I mean, the second tweet, I think, was, like, Low, low IQ, IQ in the 50s, We've right? We've never Which tested it. <laughs> we have, have we tested Nick's IQ, Brett? I've... We know you I'm, have I'm, one of... I'm uh, pretty sure it's not in the 50s. It's but we definitely don't, not in the 50s. Now I, we're assuming low. No, here's here's the thing. <laughs> Other than the whole in, Noda thing, in Nick the, has always been a very smart person. In the conversations that I've had with Nick, there are times where I have felt... And this is very rare for me that I was not the smartest person in the room. No, I think Nick's a very bright individual. So the idea that you would go after him in that way and you would be so derogatory in name-calling when you could, as two intellectual individuals, actually have a conversation... It was a Nazi accusation. Not that's once. That's intellectual so about it. Not once did it... To not Diaz? Once Let's did, ultimately, it was a proxy war. Wait, 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 wait. Right? Let's so, back up. Yeah. And not once did Nick use that phrase. On behalf of poor young Morgan, let's back up and focus on something that Brett just said. On the rare occasion, I felt like I wasn't the smartest person in the room. How do you deal with this? I... You, you just scream it out. Like, it, it's... Uh, I'm speechless, honestly. Well, I, I know that he needs his ego stroked, so I just kind of go Amongst with it. Amongst other things, right, bro? Huh? <laughs> How did I know you were going to do that? Um, right? 
So yeah, I just kind of, I kind of go with it. But you yeah. know, I I feel like he needs to feel that way, and I don't want to make him feel dumb when I talk. So. <laughs> But that's the thing. That's there's, the burden of being more intelligent. But there are times. It is. It's tough. But, INTJ, man. But to point, but to bring up, to actually follow up to what Morgan said, there will be times where she's talking about things where she is the smartest person Chili. in the room. Expert. <laughs> Chili. <laughs> By association. No, right. I mean, seriously, Blogging. though. Things like things Tumblr. like literature. Yeah. Li the, literature. The, the vast amount of typewriters of content that she's consumed. Oh uh, yeah. And and you know blows me out of the water. I mean, she can read probably a hundred books in the time that it takes me to read two. Absolutely. Right. Um, and so there's a vast breadth of knowledge well, there. When you have at no friends. Own, and he goes at his own <laughs> pace, too. Right. Well, he that's reads, the thing. Is a lot of people read at your own pace. Well, yeah. a lot of people mistake, you know, intellectual horsepower for knowing a lot. Like, right. a lot of it's rote memorization, sure. not the, you know, John Nash style, you know, yeah. mega wattage for math and logic. So, Everybody is so smart we don't, at something. I'm just yes. saying... Based on what we've just established, we don't know that he was wrong. And I think it's wrong to assume he's wrong because he's a Mises fellow. And he knows math and he knows megawattage. Well, here's the thing. The, it, it, Tom Woods is hugely influential. He has the biggest libertarian podcast, second only to us. Hold on. I'm getting a phone call from Kat and Agnos. Hold on. Kat? Hello? Is this Chris Bangle? Yes. We're on the podcast. What are you doing? Well, I'm live reporting from the scene of a terrible accident in Muncie, Indiana. Uh-oh, what happened? Well, long story short, short, my roommate tried to cook a turkey bacon, being the uh, vegan, well, snowflake she is. Turkey and bacon, she tried to cook a turkey, Brett. Turkey, turkey, Blasphemy. Turkey burger, actually. And it's well, like even worse. She didn't, that you, she didn't realize you can't put grease on the stove. And oh, grease fire. And oh, boy. You know, Flames are as tall as the ceiling. Girl, yeah. Flames as tall as the ceiling, you said. Yeah. Yes. It was yeah. so dramatic. And Water we put it out with a fire extinguisher that we had oh, stolen at months least prior. Was a fire extinguisher and that they stole. we lived. You lived. Okay. Did you call the fire department? We did. And we told them specifically on the phone that the fire was out. We just wanted them to tell us how to get the smoke out. And next thing we know, four full-sized fire trucks are down our street. Well, that's a, this is your first day back, right? This is our second day back. All right. How, how much weed have you smoked? We have not smoked any weed, actually. But I feel very funny with all the smoke from the fire. <laughs> it's not really airing out. Well, I am not smoke doing well. from the fire, guys. We are, from the peace pipes. Yeah, we are glad that you are okay. We thank you for calling with an update. The audience misses you. Greg does not miss you. I miss them, too. Tell her I want to put her Greg doesn't pocket. miss me. Greg, do you miss Cat? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like the Confederacy. <laughs> like the Confederacy. <laughs> Greg. All right. Is there anything that you want to say to the audience? Well, I would just like to tell the audience thank you for supporting me. Thank you for checking in that I'm alive. Um, barely. I almost died. And uh, I will be back soon, I promise. Would you like to scat for us? Oh, would I like to scat? <clears throat> sure. A five, six, seven, eight. Beep, bop, diddly, dap, skiddly, dap. All right, that's enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> that's cultural appropriation. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so anyways, yes, my, my problem with the, with the Nick Sarwark thing is that he went after Tom Woods. And, like, I wasn't aware of the Diaz speech. I didn't know anything about it. All of a sudden, I just see it all blowing up. And I'm like, I like Tom Woods. I listen to Tom Woods every day. What's Nick's problem? You know, and then it just turns into a big thing, and then people go, well, I'm a right libertarian. What is, I like Mises. What is he talking about? They don't know, it, and it's, and I told Nick this. I said, you, you are, you have the, what we call in marketing, the curse of knowledge. Just because you know 100% about your industry, don't assume that everybody else watching knows 100%. They know 5%. And so they don't know the backstory that we've just presented to everybody. They don't know all the things that we know. They, they just see you picking on the guy that they listen to every day that they like. They, they don't know that he's a secret racist that hates Jews and blacks and started the League of the South or whatever. Like, they don't, and they don't even really necessarily care because I listen to Tom Woods every day. I, I started listening because I was like, you know what? He is popular. I should know my competition. And I ended up liking it. But he's I excellent. 
But I had an aversion to him because he's a, affiliated with the Mises Institute in Lou Rockwell. And, but he went to Columbia. Right. But he, you know, it's not like he went to Auburn and graduated from there. And so Nick picked a fight with somebody he couldn't fight with. You don't, like you, it, it's one thing to punch up a little bit, but don't, you know, like don't punch up to somebody. You, you, if you're going to go after in a, in a drunken tweet, don't pick Tom Woods. Pick like Mark Thornton. <laughs> Lou Rockwell. Pick Lou Rockwell. <laughs> Please. You, I pick would, the person responsible. I Don't be, pick somebody by association. I would be on your side. Right, everyone would. would. That's right. the whole point. He's a dick. And if you did, instead of doing it the way he did it and just said, when you stand that close, you know, I, I worry about you getting hit in the face by a Sig hail, <laughs> then it would have been totally different. But by doing it the way he did it, it was just the wrong way, the wrong time, and nothing does a worse job or a better job of turning away people than self-righteous condescension. And I just, I it's DM'd toxic. him. I DM'd him and I said, "What were you thinking?" And he's like, "I'm just trying to grow the Libertarian Party." Bullshit. And, and I was like, "By alienating purge. people like me, like it, it just was. It was a bad idea. We'll get past it. It's fine. It, it, it's just it's a momentary kerfuffle. But I do think that it. We normally don't talk about interparty skirmishes, but I think that that's really tied in well with this. Now, to present the opposite side, I mean, what, what, what do you, was he justified? Yeah, I, I, I've been on Nick's side of the entire thing from the beginning. Nick was right. Again, it comes back to tactical decision making. Was it the right time? Was it the right person? Was it the right, you know, but was it warranted, though? Was that a warranted thing after that speech? I didn't think that speech was that offensive. Again, I agreed with 80 percent of it. Especially the blood and soil part. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> no. Just, no. I mean, it, it wasn't a bad speech. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the a shame. Pro, it was about the problems with libertarianism. And the reason I agreed with so much of it is because we've been down this road. Or I mean, it's more in worldview one. But like, I agree like you. Like in an election, you go to whatever you can find the most popular protest type of votes, the highest number of protest votes. That's the kind of candidate you field, and it depends on the popularity of the person in office. But man, this just seemed like. I have been holding this in, and I cannot wait to get you fuckers out. And this is a this is a starting of a war. Instead of like saying, call your old buddy Chris and Greg and say, hey, can I have an hour? And we totally would do that, you know, because this is something that requires nuance and conversation. Can we and downplay the League of the South membership and uh, you know charter name and and talk that's a the thing. You know, you take Nick didn't even bring. bring up- some of those things up. Nick didn't bring up being a founding member of League of the South. It was other people that brought oh, that yeah. into the conversation. It was other people that brought the LVMI uh, scholars and and um, what are they? The, the anyway, the LVMI folks, the fellows um, that were Trump supporters that you know oh, yeah, the again get Trump get lumped into the alt right. It was other people that brought that up. Nick was simply pointing to the association. And then the stupidity of him only taking away that political strategy. And then everything after that became, for me, became Woods being a name calling bully. I probably would too if you say that they, the you took away that that was the only takeaway from Rothbard's you know essay on right wing populism in the context of the Charlottesville Nazi rally. That is one I would go wild, batshit crazy to disavow and make it clear I am not a Nazi or sympathetic to anyone that supports their type of things. And you'll also notice that of the three parties that actually have a national office, um, there was only one that actually came out against bigotry in a press in a release that was sent out two days after Charlottesville. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the liber- well, Westbury was author. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. But again, it's one of those things where it's like I I'm hate think- cancer. We're again, we're the only party in America am- that's against cancer. But so they're the only that. ones that actually said it. Right, but who Man. cares? It's a pr- <laughs> it, it, we as- all assume nobody right. says we want bigotry. Every, we're the only party in America that supports white supremacy. Like no decent, one's going to issue a press release on that. Again, decent, but you're looking you're looking at the mainstream media news cycle. Right. Yeah, the mainstream and, media doesn't care what the Libertarian Party said. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> right. But what but what the Libertarian Party is coming about in doing in sending out that release is pointing out that if unequivocally, you're for a home, if you're looking for a home. We're the ones that aren't bigots. And you know what? If you are a bigot, you're not welcome with us. We, Re- like Wes said, resign right. your membership this today. This is what I think. That the national guy authors it, and this is pretty damn convenient that these two things are in hand. We're the only people 
And then there's a declaration and a drawing of that distinction that follows on Dr. Woods by the national chairman and the person that's the only paid, you know, national office worker. No, there's way more than one. Or, I mean, he's the most prominent of the, yeah. exe- he's the executive director? He's the executive director. Yeah, so the executive department. director and the chairman in this environment tag team the right, the Misesians. Do they, though? You put out that declaration and then you call the other one a Nazi. And it's been a long-standing grudge. Maybe this is the time for El, the, El, the schism. El Perjo. And I don't know that at all, but it just felt like, damn, this is like a vaudeville slapping people around. Right. You know? And maybe I could be totally imposing that on there, and I'm not by any means saying that's what happened, but I was just like, man, for a guy that's a pretty solid dude, yes, he gets some toxic, toxic associations because he very much repeatedly has on classical traditionalists like Gottfried, who the only reason he's not called a Nazi is because his name's Gottfried. <laughs> he has the ultimate trump card on he that. Was it too? Yes. Right. I mean, yeah, you can't even call him that because then he just throws that up. I mean, so. And that was thrown up a lot in the discussion. Oh yeah. I think my dentist became a Jew for the jokes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Tim Watley, yeah. yeah. But I'm just like, so like Woods just to me is such. You want to do it at Lou Rockwell? I am behind you 100 percent because that guy is a. He's a guy that at this point, like I said, he's just a historian of what happened in the early days. But man, Tom Woods, to me, is not the guy that I would, one, strategically to choose, and two, think earned this for any reason other than he is pretty fearless in who he talks to. The, the other part of this is that libertarian media, and this is my final point, and then we'll we'll start wrapping up, but the... the the goal of libertarian media and libertarian think tanks are much different than libertarian parties, mm-hmm. where we would never sit here and introduce a show by saying, are you against the Jews, Greg? We're not bigots. Like, we don't need to make that statement, but a political party feels the need to make that statement. Right, where, very true. Where we're going to go, what is racism? Let's talk about racism. Let's get into the weeds on what it means to be a bigot and risk the fact that there will be listeners who will turn this off and go, oh, that's just a racist asshole. Like, the, the, the goal of a Tom Woods show is to debate ideas and wrestle with ideas and give people food for thought so they can come to their own conclusions, whereas a political party is trying to tell you the conclusions that they want you to come to. Like, it, it's two t- completely different goals. And so th- the idea that you'd go after, like, Go after Republicans and Democrats. Like I just, I just get exhausted by all the infighting and all but that he did. Kind of stuff. So, what do you mean? He did go after a Republican. Yeah, this is the not debate. The is he's thing. not a party member? He, he's pe- just a libertarian. People don't. Little L. People do not make that distinction. No, they, they just, don't. They just don't. They. Rand Paul. Everyone thinks not. He's a Republican. He's that libertarian guy, like his dad. Right. But, you know, it's the it, libertarian's the brand he carries with him. That's the lead lead identifier. Again, it's curse of knowledge. It's right. it's, it's 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 like this. This show, and I've had conversations with the state chairman of the LPIN, he doesn't want this show to be associated with the LPIN, nor do we want the show to be associated with the LPIN. Like, we, we are two distinct, separate entities. We just happen to be in Indiana, and they happen to be in Indiana, too, and we happen to be libertarians. Like, it's, it's two distinct, completely different things, but to the local political class, they don't make a distinction a lot right. of times between what I say or Greg says, and what the, the state The official party position thinks, of the party. Which is, it, which is not our fault, which is not the fault of the LPIN. It is the fault of the ridiculous, dumb political commentator who is trying to lump us all together. Like, it's, or, you know, the local Republican who's trying to make hay for his What own. about the local dominatrix? Uh, I mean... Sorry, former dominatrix. She's... She, don't, Loves John Greg, from what I hear. I don't know. <sighs> Might be, uh, might be climbing up with her 50-foot angel on her back to take down the Diana statue and then hump it. Uh, now, Matt, final words. It's a hell of a climb, 50 feet. <laughs> well, and, our and she's like 6'9", so yeah, I mean, it's not least. like she doesn't have a head start. <laughs> Huge hands. No problem in that area. Uh, Matt, your final thoughts for this episode. Well, uh, thanks for having me back, even with uh, Never Bittner here. Uh, but good to see you again. It's, in it's all been quite traumatic. Are you okay? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, look, I, I don't. We haven't seen the end of this. Uh, this uh, the Charlottesville was a coming out party to a large degree. Yeah. Um, now they made the news cycle. It's not done. Uh, Richard it, Spencer's not the kind of that quits. Right. We're we're going to see more, which is unfortunate. 
uh, it's it's garbage, and and I do think you know libertarians forget you know libertarian party movement whatever blah blah blah. I mean libertarians need to not associate with this in any shape or form, in my opinion. And uh, which I think drove the chairman's decision. I- exactly, which um, is fine because it makes. Strategic and to that sense end, right? That I agree with I think largely what most of us are saying. Uh, wrong person at the wrong time. Um, but there's a an incredible long history between uh, you know the Rothbardians and and the Libertarian Party, and and that ain't gonna end anytime soon either, unfortunately. And, and so, there's right orthodoxy and left or- orthodoxy exactly. within the the party. The key is keeping them together on election day. Yep, that's it. Which has not hate each other the rest of the time, pretty much ever. So right. you know the key has not been uh, found. Little Brett Bittner. Well, you know, for me, I think it's we're going to continue to see these kinds of things and we're going to see it going both ways. We're going to see that there are going to be alt-right people who disrupt uh, some of the the collectivist activities that take place. We're going to see the violence continue. We're probably going to see the violence escalate because, again, there's a lot of hard feelings between the two and everybody is being pushed to one side or the other. And as libertarians and as honestly, as human beings, we need to be focused on uh, detesting the violence that takes place uh, to pursue and achieve political and social ends. Very good. His nap. My nap. <laughs> Greg? Um, I agree just like you. I think this is, this is just the powder keg that bursted before what we're about to experience, and I can't stand it because... No matter what you may want to be, where it's nuanced and there, you know, the ability to say, well, you know, the entire left is an Antifa and the entire right isn't the KKK. Fake news. It doesn't matter. You might have to stop memeing. That's the real threat here. Oh. <laughs> you shut your damn poor mouth. <laughs> Never. Well, you know what we really need that to get That is a violation of my First Amendment right. <laughs> what we really need to get back to and in, in, to bring this country together is arguing over whether it's in and out or Five Guys. <laughs> That's a right. Thank you, Brett. That's what we need to get back to. That's the yeah. age-old question. There's some always Bittner right there. That was, yeah. Listen, I listen. My stance on Bittner has softened. You say that's. I mean, that is the key. That's it Aristotle has. versus Plato. Five guys versus In and Out. I'm just saying. I mean, that's the real debate in this country. And I, I for one, am Team In and Out. Oh yeah, animal style for life. All I've the only, way. I've only had it once, so Five Guys. That's what I'm going with. Oh. I wish you didn't hate black people, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will sign your petition. You, no. you cuck. All yeah, right. I did love that Fee put, oh, God, Fee, a guy wrote an article for Fee that said, why it doesn't bother to be called a cuck anymore. And the irony that Jeffrey Tucker's organization authored that was pretty hilarious. Right, when he's called a cuck all the time. Oh, yeah. I mean, he invites it the way he dresses in his bow tie. He does. Brett. Yeah, <laughs> he doesn't wear a bow tie. I don't wear a bow you don't tie. Sound anything like Tucker? Seems like a real bow tie kind of guy to me. He actually, you know, I've been considering it's adding happen. the bow tie to my. Uh... It's gonna happen. How pussy? How what? How dry is your pussy right now? <laughs> so dry, she said. <laughs> Toss me some chili. <laughs> so honestly, like. Ugh. Well, I mean, I mean, there's a clear distinction too between being a Southern dandy and being <laughs> a, a left libertarian cuck. Like, uh-huh. There is a very, very clear line, and it's seersucker line. But- Bittner is prepared to wear the bow tie because he was a ballerina in middle school. <laughs> so The only thing that matters, like Abraham Lincoln said, be a good one. Were you right. a good one? Were you a good ballerina? I'm good at everything. I want you to stand on your toes right here on the table. <laughs> Tip toes. Like you, Kate Winslet in Titanic. You poor woman. You poor woman. I know. <laughs> she said this is why I drink this so is After why she drank a bottle of wine. Yeah. A whole bottle of Moscato. Bonged it, really. Really, yeah. She's, and she was trying to shotgun a summer shandy too. No, she's a well. She's twenty one. Like we'll, what we'll we... go out on the we'll go out on the balcony in a little bit. And show her how to <laughs> shotgun a beer. Oh my God. Get down on one knee. Get your key or your car key out. Oh so God, how went, classy! She went to Funzie. I'm sure she knows how to shotgun. Well, a beer. I was going to say, does it ever intimidate? No, she was you? asking Greg and I earlier how you do that, and so That's we need right. some we need well, some bush gonna, light, and right. then we can show her. No friends, I forgot. <laughs> I Single dorm, right? Single dorm girl. <laughs> 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 No, she's very nice. Thank you for contributing because I know you didn't want to and you did a good job and didn't say anything that's going to prevent you from being hired, especially since you're a My manager in training for Gold Star. <laughs> or franchise or, I guess. I don't know <laughs> what the terminology is. But um, I would say this. It does concern me because there, this is going to sell newspapers. It's going to sell media time. It's mm-hmm. going to feed 
And it's people don't have the time to say, well, not everybody on the right loves, you know, or hates black people, and not everybody on the left hates, uh, or, you know, is a violent fascist that, you know, genderqueer. Right. And not only that, it's also going to distract from what's actually happening from a policy perspective. Granted, we're in the middle of the, the recess uh, for Congress, but this is still keeping the news cycle focused on this rather than what's actually happening. Keeps the doors government. open for these media companies, really. And so they're yeah. going to emphasize it. And Richard Spencer is going, he's a provocateur. Stephen Miller's in the White House. Steve Bannon is in the White House. This isn't going away. This is culture wars, and it's going to be the most effective strategy they have to win re-election and in the midterms is to turn this into a 1994 culture war. Yep. It's see yep. the Nazi, see the Nazi, see the... Yeah, but you brought up the midterms. That's not really going to matter that much because you don't really have too many seats in the Senate that are going to be up. It's like I, uh, oh, yeah, Donnie it's Ferguson was talking that between now and 2020... Or between 2018 and 2020, it's like an 11 to 3 Republican to Democrat. Yeah, uh, they're going. Mitch McConnell's going to be Senate Majority Leader. Oh, of course. Like that's just and, it. And the Republicans will continue to have the majority in in the Senate. Yeah, it's just like if, if one of these ma- big major events happens, and and the truth is that you know it, uh, Cato put out a study about you know terrorist acts, right? Right. And so honestly, since like 1992, Morgan to a podcast, right? Yes. <laughs> Oh, I'm upset. <laughs> My feelings. Oh, I I have no friends. I read. I need my emotional support book. <laughs> I'm going to go home and journal about this podcast. <laughs> Dear diary, today it was a tremendous. <laughs> I, I have a typewriter. I do cool for Oh, I yeah. bet she does, doesn't she? It's, it's an Underwood. Underwood. It's, it's an, an Underwood. It's an Underwood typewriter. She probably has it hanging on her wall. 1912 underwriter. Tell me about how it was handcrafted and what the workers were like that made it. Yeah. Oh, you're not even a real hipster. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I'm going to go drink a craft beer and drown my sorrows. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think that unless another major event happens by the left, because it's jihadists, then right-wing, you know, right-wing radical terrorists, they are like, what, 11% or so of attacks since 1992. And then the left is radically less, but if you just measure from 2012 on, the left's rising trend. So it's going to be who creates the most terrorist environment between the right and left ideologies. Um, and then just the last thing I'd say is you have to be very careful about how you, you know, how how much you tie the right wing to the alt right. And the reason I say that is because of Timothy McVeigh. Right. Yeah. Because it would be very easily to say Timothy McVeigh, a Libertarian Party member. And then ask the chairman, well, are you guys pro-federal bu- building bombing? Is that part of the platform? That comes right after interstellar travel. Right. You know, so be very careful about how you toss that around as a libertarian because we live in glass houses as people, you know, as, yes. as a movement. So that would be my last thing. And uh, Bittner, good to see you. Glad you're doing healthy. Yes, sir. You, yes, know, uh, that's you weren't right. even racist. I'm so proud of you. That's right, Morgan. Two cats, two scoops, two co-hosts, two genders. Uh, deal with, deal with it. it. <laughs> no, I will say you you owe Kat uh, a debt of gratitude because she's made me possibly Bittner. Mm-hmm. Uh, after a long time of, of, of firm, never Bittner stance. Well, she is definitely the superior in Agnos. Oh, 100%. I'm still never Bittner, just for the record. <laughs> I, no, I don't blame you. If I had to see him naked, too, I, wouldn't, I would be very, very anti-Bittner. You're making some assumptions there, Chris. Yes, well... Uh, Assume away. You two She's... waiting for marriage? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, no, she went to Ball State, please. Yeah. Um, so... You ever heard of an offensive line? She has. <laughs> oh, okay. I that, I, wow. I don't think I get it. Oh, you did from the entire offensive line, is what. Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. Jocks aren't my type. Yeah, she. I like them kind racist. of weak and you know. Oh she, wow. She likes old creepy weirdos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Creepy, well, I love you guys. Libertarian podcaster. Whisper taxation is theft into my ear. <laughs> oh my uh, but no, I, I'm possibly bitten her now. Uh, I like Morgan. She's been, uh, I like her a lot. We had a nice 
three hour conversation one night, and I, I was. Uh, was this when you were distracting her from the concert that we were attending? Did she was bored? She, oh, it, was, okay. it was your no, '90s music. This was a different night. This I don't was, know. Oh, okay, but we talk so much. It's just, right. we're, she has no friends. You know how I am about collecting strange, lonely. Women. Matt Whitliff has to take off. And I just want to personally right, thank man. him for coming on because I know how difficult it is here. with his schedule. And thank happy you. belated birthday! If yeah. you're friends with him on social media, wish him happy belated yeah. birthday. But. Thank uh, you. But yeah, Morgan. Me, Morgan's Thanks delightful. Me. She's been a good addition to your life. You seem very happy. <laughs> your the Never Bittner campaign was uh, when pre 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 diabetes Brett pre diagnosis Brett was a little bit hard to handle, uh, mm -hmm. and it's just turned into a, a great hashtag. And many many people. I got a uh, I did get a note from one of our listeners on Snapchat. He said I uh, I've never heard Brett on the show. I joined after Never Bittner started. I'm not sure if I like that guy yet or not. All so, right. so I think you won them over. This was a very good episode. So, thank you for contributing. Yes, very much so. so we needed it because no, I mean, you know a lot about the early origins, and that's hard to find. Yep. So, thank you very much. So, and yeah, uh, usually, if you know all that, you don't want to live anymore. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, but honestly, you're going to need to write that down eventually, so it's not lost to the annals of the party history. <laughs> oh, don't worry, Karen and Harless, I'm sure, has written it down. The okay. Historic preservation stuff. One more night. It'll uh, be there forever. One more night like tonight, and he's getting a large sweet tea from Chick Fil A and ending it all. <laughs> Just, he's, he's in the alley. He's eating donuts. Going. Just brimly me, bro. <laughs> It'll be nothing but but Tim Hortons and uh, Chick Fil A sweet tea. <laughs> oh, if you can keep it from the. She didn't share. Honestly. She, right now you have the metabolism of a hummingbird, but uh, 26 is fast approaching. Right, Greg? Oh, wow. I would never say that about Morgan. I think too highly of her. <laughs> okay. You really let me down as a co-host there. Uh, She's about to, you know, the snowflake's about to become a blizzard. October! <laughs> 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 I'm it's really, really cold here. It's it is like, cold. It's sixty. Uh, it's sixty six. I'm like, dying. I, I told you to get a blanket earlier. <laughs> as, I'm not here's a box of matches. Well, here's no a... no doubt. That's the, the Morgan style. But I told you get a blanket because <laughs> I don't want to touch your masturbation blanket. I don't masturbate on blankets. I'm please talking to the microphone. <laughs> I, I didn't want to call you I, that. I, I masturbate in my mug and bun cups. <laughs> Actually, it's this one. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> Liberty Force by Johnny Rocket Launchpad is uh, very sticky. All right, thank you so much for joining us here on We Are Libertarians. We appreciate you so much. We thank all of the 103 people that have donated. That was a uh, uh, great to get to talk to them today. We're going to do more of that. We're going to have some Patreon uh, and and membership uh, subscription thingies rolling out soon. I'm working on that. I am. Uh, Probably going to kill myself, honestly, if I have to, to sit in front of my WordPress for one more weekend uh, like I have the last few. But we're getting it done. We're growing this thing, and we're doing it with your help. We are bootstrapping this, and so you are the reason that you can hear We Are Libertarians and get such great information from uh, people like Greg and Brett. And thanks for being here, Morgan. <laughs> we appreciate having you on the show, and uh, as always, we promise to do better next time. All right, let me 